Order. Order. Members will resume their seats, please. Thank you. Welcome, members, to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee <coughs> excuse me, on the response to COVID-19. Agenda item one is the minutes of the proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 7th of May. Members are asked to note these minutes, which Mr Beggs has agreed. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report, which is available on the committee's web page. Agenda item two is a statement from the Minister for Justice. The Speaker received notification on the 11th of May that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to deliver is included in your pack at page 7. I would like to welcome Mrs Naomi Long, the Minister for Justice, to this meeting of the Committee. I would also like to welcome Mr Peter May, Permanent Secretary in the Department of Justice, who is accompanying the Minister today. Before the Minister makes her statement, I want to remind members that following it, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, not to make speeches. Members who ask short, sharp, focused questions will be invited to ask a supplementary question if they wish. Members who engage in lengthy preambles may find that they will not get to put a question or at least a supplementary. This approach has been taken at the Ad Hoc Committee over recent weeks and has generally worked well. I therefore intend to continue that approach today. However, it is important that I get cooperation from members, and I will, of course, be asking the Minister to give succinct answers as well. I invite the Minister to make her statement, which should be heard by members without interruption. I call the Minister for Justice, Mrs Naomi Long. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I believe I was the first minister to take general questions from the Assembly on COVID-19 back in March. Since then, I have engaged with members on a range of other business, including the second reading of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. And so I very much welcome the opportunity to return to the Chamber today, specifically to update members on my department's ongoing response to the pandemic. It has been 10 weeks since the first case of COVID-19 was identified here, and we are now in week eight of lockdown. It would be difficult to overstate how much life has changed for all of us in that time. For some of us, that has been a change to our working patterns and social lives. For others, the change has been more permanent and profound. My thoughts are particularly with all of those who have lost loved ones at this time, whether through COVID-19 or otherwise. It is never easy to lose someone we love, but even the small comforts we can usually draw from those final moments in their company the sense of love and support from being borne up by family and friends in our grief, and the ability to pay a tribute to them with those who knew them, has been denied to many families in these unprecedented circumstances. As a community, I know we will want to find a way to pay our respects and acknowledge our loss when this is over. I will come on to the work of my department shortly, but I would first like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that lockdown is not easy. Being apart from our family, our friends, our support networks, especially at a time of crisis, is unnatural for us. It is not something that would be mandated by government, except in the most extreme circumstances, such as the biggest public health emergency in living memory. And it is not something which we should sustain for any longer than is absolutely necessary. It is a measure that has been taken to save lives, but I also recognise that in the process it has turned many lives upside down. The economic challenge we now face is real, but just as real is the challenge to rebuild our relationships, our families and our communities as we move forward. I hope that the Executive's planned way forward for easing lockdown, published on Tuesday of this week, goes some way not only to illustrate that there is light at the end of the tunnel, but also to reassure people that the sacrifices we have made to date, though challenging and difficult, have slowed the spread of the virus and saved lives. I want to pay tribute to everyone in the health service and all of the key workers right across our community who are on the front line, caring for our sick and vulnerable, working to keep our communities clean and safe, securing our critical infrastructure and ensuring that we have food in our cupboards. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to everyone playing their part to keep people safe and healthy throughout the pandemic. 
I am enormously proud of the staff in my own department who have been working hard to protect and sustain vital public services in such challenging circumstances. My focus and that of my department has been on ensuring key services are maintained, staff and those in our care are protected and public safety is preserved. The department was quick to organise its response and within days of the World Health Organisation declaring COVID-19 a global pandemic, we had stood up both our departmental operations centre and our business continuity arrangements. Both have worked well in providing evidence and analysis to support quick and clear decision making, identifying issues which require escalation to the executive office or the civil contingencies group. The department has also played a key role in the executive strategy for dealing with COVID-19. We have two work streams in that strategy. The first is ensuring the continued safety of custodial environments. Achieving this has taken a significant effort by a large number of people, and I would like to pay tribute to all staff within both the prison service and the Youth Justice Agency. A range of infection control measures have been put in place within custodial environments. These include precautionary isolation for new committals, of which there were 198 during the month of April, and the availability of personal protective equipment for staff. New committals are now being tested for COVID-19 as part of the committal process. The reduction of footfall in prisons through the suspension of visits and the introduction of virtual visits has helped, as is the temporary release of prisoners. So far, approximately 142 prisoners due for release over the, the next three months have been released under the scheme. Notwithstanding these releases, however, our present population remains at almost 1,400. Taken together, these measures have meant that only one prisoner in our care has tested positive for COVID-19, and it's important to note that this individual tested positive in the community before their committal to custody. Six prison officers have tested positive for COVID-19, five were tested more than four weeks ago, and one tested positive earlier this week. Our thoughts are with each of them and their families as they continue their recovery. Our second work stream within the executive strategy is to make arrangements to respect the dignity of the deceased. This has involved two main actions for the department. The first action was to establish additional mortuary capacity through development of a temporary resting place at Kenniger, which, as I have said previously, is something I could never have anticipated having to plan for in my political career. Staff in my department, partners and contractors worked extremely hard to develop the site within a very short time frame, and it has been handed over from contractors at the end of April. It is an excellent facility, but one I hope we never need to use. Should it ever be needed, the PSNI has agreed to lead on its day-to-day -day operations, and I'm grateful to the Chief Constable for his willingness to undertake that role. The second action was to ensure funeral directors have enough personal protection equipment. Despite some initial difficulties, that situation is improving and sufficient PPE is now available for them. While the work in prisons and on the temporary resting place are significant, it would be very remiss of me not to mention the excellent work that has taken place more widely. Staff throughout the department have risen to the challenges and have quickly reorganised and found new ways to ensure key services continue to operate. A good example of this is in the courts and tribunal service, where business has been concentrated in five venues and is delivered in a range of creative ways, making the best use of IT and road assistance to ensure social distancing. This has meant that the volumes of court business have reduced, and this has had an impact on the legal profession. In response, last week I introduced the interim payment scheme to provide earlier payment of legal aid fees due to solicitors and barristers. This is intended to protect our cash flow and help ensure there is a viable legal aid supplier base at the end of the pandemic in order to safeguard access to justice. As well as continuing to deliver key public services, I'm really pleased that staff have been able to continue delivering on a number of other priorities, such as the domestic abuse bill. The bill and the need for such legislation has been brought into stark relief in recent days. Whilst many of us see home as a safe place, for those affected by domestic abuse or violence, it is often the place where they are most vulnerable to their abuser, and those already at risk have found themselves cut off from their normal support networks. In these circumstances, their vulnerability and risk of harm is even greater. Information from police indicates an increase in reporting of incidents during the COVID-19 lockdown of almost 10 per cent. Calls to the 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline for the most recent week were around 35 per cent higher when compared to the average weekly calls level during the month of February. 
In addition to bringing forward the bill, my department and our partners are taking more immediate action to address this issue and ensure support is available and key needs are met. Some of these measures require a multi-agency operational response. This is being led by the PSNI, which along with statutory and voluntary sector partners meets on a weekly basis to coordinate action. As part of this, the PSNI is engaging with 1,200 of the highest risk victims. A dedicated team is also contacting lower and medium risk victims, reporting abuse, providing them with signposting to key services and support. Greater public awareness is also important, and I've relaunched the See the Signs media campaign, promoting available support routes for victims, as well as encouraging police reporting. This is running on TV, radio and social media until the 20th of May, and complements the Police Behind Closed Doors social media campaign, which launched at the beginning of the lockdown period. There has been much in the media, both locally and nationally, on the issues of PPE and testing. We have had a clear focus from the beginning on ensuring our frontline staff are adequately protected. The prison service has worked hard to secure PPE and sufficient supplies continue to be available. We are monitoring stocks across frontline areas of the department, as well as within the PSNI on a very regular basis, and sufficient supply is there. Testing has been available for frontline staff who need it from the 7th of April, and testing capacity has since been ramped up further. This is very welcome. I would also like to pay tribute to the PSNI who have played a key role in policing the coronavirus restriction regulations brought forward by the Health Minister to limit community transmission of COVID-19. As I said previously, I believe fundamentally in personal freedom, but I also believe in personal responsibility. If people will not take responsibility for their actions, then they must be held responsible, and I am grateful to the PSNI for their key role in those difficult circumstances. We are not yet out of the woods, and therefore we need to proceed with caution and care. The stay-at-home message remains in place for us at this point. Nonetheless, as the First and Deputy First Ministers announced on Tuesday, it is right that we are thinking ahead and planning for the next stage in a careful and considered way. Like others, my department has started working on recovery planning. Our aim will be to manage a gradual return to, to more normal levels of operation, but also making sure that we retain some of the positive ways of working that have been introduced in response to the current situation. Our recovery plan will take into account public health advice and the need to deliver important public services in the best way we can. I'm grateful to the department's staff and all our partners for the positive contribution they have made to helping keep Northern Ireland safe and for the delivery of important public services during these most unusual and unprecedented times. Thank you. Thank, I thank the Minister for her statement. Uh, before I invite uh, members to ask their questions, I think this is the first time uh, Ms Linda Dillon has been in the Chamber uh, since the outrageous threats were made against her person. And on behalf of the whole House, I want to say that we condemn those responsible and stand in solidarity with you. I will allow a period of around an hour for questions. I remind members of what I said at the start of this meeting. Members should not preface their question with a speech or a statement. There will be an opportunity for supplementary questions, but that will be dependent upon members abiding uh, by those conditions. The first person I wish to call is the Chair of the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Given. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, just at the outset, uh, can I associate uh, myself with your condemnation of those threats? Uh, that have been issued against the Deputy uh, Chair of the Justice Committee and indeed two other members of that committee, Duke Beatty and Patsy McGlone, uh, and then Steve Aiken, uh, another member of this House, uh, and uh, again condemn that threat uh, utterly uh, and uh, say to those members that you have my support in carrying out your role and to those journalists uh, that have been threatened similarly to condemn the threat against them and for uh, support to the important work that they do uh, in terms of the job that they have to uh, carry out. Um, can I associate myself with the Minister's remarks in paying tribute to uh, those within her department and uh, all of the agencies 
uh, involved in the criminal justice system for the ongoing work that they're carrying out uh, in respect of their response to COVID-19. Uh, I'm pleased the Minister came to the House today. The committee did uh, suggest to the Minister uh, to bring this statement to the ad hoc committee after we called her before the Justice Committee. I was disappointed that it was deferred from last week and the committee wasn't advised the Justice Committee of that deferral, but nevertheless, uh, the Minister is here now. In terms of the information contained uh, in the statement, and the Minister has referred to lockdown on numerous occasions. Uh, so far, approximately 142 prisoners have been released, of which a number of them have had to be returned to prison uh, for various breaches. Um, can the Minister advise if that figure has went up and if there is any further intention of releasing more prisoners or given the improving situation in our prison service for those prisoners that have been temporarily uh, released to be returned to uh, fulfil their custodial sentence? Well, I thank the Chairman um, for his comments. To clarify, um, my statement was, was postponed from last week. Um, in order to facilitate a statement which then never took place from the First and Deputy First Minister. Um, so it was a courtesy um, to them because they were intending to make a statement um, to the House. With respect um, to the early release uh, scheme, 142 individuals have been released under the terms of the scheme. Eight individuals were sub subsequently arrested, charged and returned to custody. It is worth noting um, that during that period, a number of those individuals had not committed additional offences, but had simply varied from the terms and conditions of their curfew, which was attached to the release. The majority of the prisoners who have been released have now seen out their sentence and are time served, um, and so will not be recalled at this point in time. Um, however, those who were recalled will go through a normal process um, in terms if they were caught um, doing something which was potentially illegal and there were any alleged offences, they will go through the courts in the normal way. And it wouldn't obviously um, be appropriate for me to prejudge the outcome um, of the court process um, in that way. In terms of whether or not it will be needed, we don't have an improving situation with respect um, to attendance at work uh, within the prison service. Um, at the moment, it is a fairly static situation. Um, that is not because of large numbers of people who are self-isolating due to symptoms, but is reflective of the fact that many of the officers who are currently not able to attend work, it is because of their own vulnerabilities. So some are shielding or some are living with those who are shielding and are unable to return to work. Testing, therefore, will have some impact on return to work capability, but not perhaps as much as people would have hoped um, in terms of being able to reduce the overall numbers um, who can't attend for work on a regular basis. We will have to, as I have said before, consider um, in due course what, what options are still available to us in terms of maintaining a, a good ratio between prison officers um, and those who are committed to our care. It's worth bearing in mind that during this period there have been significant committals to the prison system, so it should not be assumed that numbers are dropping because of release when we have significant committals either on remand um, or as a result of cases passing through the courts. Um, so I think we need to take all of that in the round and make those judgments at the appropriate time. Mr Given for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, going forward uh, in terms of the various steps that have been now outlined by the Executive, the police are going to have a critical role in respect of this. What assurances can the Justice Minister give us that in the placing of these regulations, as they may uh, and will need to be amended going forward, that all of the decision-making process will be quality assured so that we don't have a repetition of what happened at the very start of this process, that the police then needed to introduce a system to check that penalties that were being issued were appropriately uh, being carried out. And I agree with the Minister on this issue. Social responsibility and personal responsibility is where the focus needs to be. Policing and regulating ourselves out of this crisis is not going to be the most successful way. It is about all of us individually and collectively acting with social responsibility. Well, I mean, there are a number of things that I want to unpack in respect of that question. First of all, I don't accept um, the Chairman's um, characterisation 
of the police's response um, in the initial phases or indeed since um, in the way it's been presented by the chairman. Um, secondly, it's an operational matter for the police how they choose um, to undertake their responsibilities with respect to the regulations and it is not my responsibility as Justice Minister to oversee the operational decisions nor indeed is it the role of this House to do so. It is a matter for the Policing Board um, to scrutinise the choices and decisions of the Chief Constable and his senior team. And, and finally, um, I think that as in all things, uh, with great freedom comes great responsibility. And I think as we increase the level of freedom that people will have to be able to return to their normal lives, they will also have to assume more and more responsibility um, for their own individual choices. And so I think it is hugely important that in the roadmap that the executive set out this week, it didn't simply set out a series of things that people could do, but it set out a rationale on which people could start to apply in their own circumstances how they may be able to judge the safety or otherwise of the choices that they were making. There will, of course, still be a role for enforcement, but it is worth also recognising that enforcement is the fourth E, not the first E, that the police engage with um, when they are dealing with these regulations. And I'm sure that as other bodies um, and other sectors um, come into play as we move forward, that other agencies will also have to take their responsibilities with respect to engaging, educating, encouraging and indeed enforcement, uh, whether that be in the workplace, whether that be um, in, other, in other sectors um, or whether indeed um, it will fall to the police in some occasions to continue to fulfil that role. I call the Deputy Chair of the Justice Committee, Ms Linda Dillon. Can I thank the Deputy Principal Speaker for your kind comments at the, at the beginning of the session and I would like to also show solidarity with the other members who were threatened and as outlined by the chair, the, the journalists who were initially threatened. Everybody should be able to go about their daily, their daily work. You don't have to agree with everything we, we think, say or do, but we're entitled to think, say and do it and, and as is everybody without fear of intimidation. So I appreciate the, the comments and the support from right across this house. Thank you. Um, just thank the Minister for her statement and just to ask the Minister, the department, your department's briefing paper on the Legal Aid COVID-19 Interim Payment Scheme outlined that there would be no, costs, no additional costs associated and that it would be dealt with, administered from within the existing Legal Aid budget. Now, whilst we understand all the reasons why, why you would need it, and I actually support the reasons and, and the committee did support it because obviously we want people to have access to justice and it's extremely important that all of those things are kept in place just like all other businesses we want to see at the other end of this that justice can still be served and people can still get access to it but we have since learned from the department of finance breakdown that there is a 0.9 million additional cost for that scheme and I was just wondering if we could get some detail around the, the discrepancy in that information to the committee. Well, I mean, first of all, can I add my um, condemnation to others um, that has already been expressed in this chamber, both in respect of the absolutely disgraceful um, intimidation which yourself and other members, um, including um, Doug Beatty and Patsy McGlone, have been subjected to, um, and, and indeed um, one of my own colleagues. It is completely unacceptable but I think it shows the desperation of those who not only want to silence the press in terms of their scrutiny, um, but also want to silence um, politicians who are willing to stand up for freedom of the press. And so I, I think it's a sign of that desperation and it is an appalling s situation um, that anyone would think in this day and age that there is any kind of acceptable level um, of threat or violence. With respect to the legal aid, we didn't say in fairness that it would not cost anything more because we can't make that prediction. We did say that there was some risk attached. For example, if someone has to change their legal counsel um, on the way through a case, there was obviously a risk that some of those payments would have been made. And so there may be um, some need to either recoup um, or indeed um, to rebalance that. So there, there will always be a little bit um, of uncertainty in any of these schemes. But what we sought to do was to try to operate a scheme which fell within the original budget in the sense that um, legal aid payments are being made early as opposed to additional. Um, so people are being paid for work that they 
would have been doing and will be doing in the future in order to aid cash flow, as opposed to being granted money in addition to the legal aid payments that they would have made. But as you will appreciate, legal aid is also unpredictable in that it is demand-led um, as opposed um, to us being able to dictate um, where the legal aid payments will come from. I'm happy um, if it would be helpful perhaps to ask um, the Permanent Secretary um, to particularly hone in on the differential in terms of the Department of Finance figures. Um, but in terms of the overall package, we do not see this as something that is going to become a burden um, on the budget for the executive um, in the longer term. Thank you, Minister. So, um, the legal aid interim payment scheme is only paying for work that has already been done by solicitors and by barristers. And as the Minister uh, indicated, we had to identify what the total potential risk uh, would be in the event that some of those uh, firms or individuals no longer continue to trade, even despite the interim payment scheme. And I think I haven't, I haven't seen the specific piece of paper to which the, the member is referring, but I think the 0.9 million was a maximum figure, and we would anticipate it being significantly less than that in practice. So that would be the, the only additional potential cost, because it could be that as a solicitor or a barrister uh, ceases to trade, so uh, 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 somebody might bring in a, a, another representative and then have to rerun some aspects of the case that way. Ms Dullum, for a supplementary. Premier, I've got to thank you. Um, just in, also in relation to access to justice then, it has been reported to me by some of the separated prisoners and their legal representatives that there are real issues with them getting access to their legal representatives. And I know that a lot of that is around the issues with not having access to um, virtual contact within the, the separated regime that you would have in, in the main prisons. I'm just wondering what is being done or can be done in relation to this, because Ronnie, Arms, Ronnie Armour rather, has highlighted that actual that virtual contact is something that they would like to remain in place going forward, and it's important that it's right across the prison prison regime if it is going to be? Well, I think continued access um, to uh, people's legal representatives is absolutely essential. Um, I'm not aware, um, I have to say, that there was a particular issue um, with respect to the separated regime. Um, it's not something that has been raised with me before today, um, but it is something that, having been raised with me, I will raise uh, with um, Ronnie Armour and ask um, for some more information. You'll appreciate um, that in terms of the virtual visiting and the virtual contact, um, that that is something that requires people to move around the prison and there are limitations on how much people can do so safely um, at this particular point in time um, due to the need to control the viral spread. So in order to keep people safe, we're having to strike a balance, but I was not aware of there being a specific issue, nor was I aware of it having been raised. And I have to say that there would have been other um, issues that have been raised and resolved very quickly. So I will try and endeavour to get back to you as, as quickly as possible with an answer and hopefully also with a solution. Okay, the chair and the deputy chair got a bit of leeway and we're 13 minutes in, four questions answered. I have 17 other people and that means we have 34 to go, and we have got about an hour. Pointed questions, pointed answers, and we are about to get a wonderful example of that from Mr Daniel McCrossan. I am always singled out. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and just to join in your comments as well, and, and of colleagues in this House, in condemning the threats against uh, colleagues in this chamber. There is no place for such in this society, and I know that it will strengthen the resolve of this House and of our parties in working together to eradicate such threats from our society. I would also like to uh, welcome the Minister's statement and her actions to date, especially in bringing forward the Domestic Abuse Bill, which is so very important and long overdue in protecting so many in our society. Uh, the Minister mentions the PSNA's actions during lockdown and the pressures that exist. Can the Minister comment on the recent news reports alleging the PSN office, uh, PSNA officers in Straban and Derry were absent from their posts and missed their shifts, and can she outline whether a full and impartial investigation is underway on the matter? Well, I can confirm the second that a full investigation is underway and on that basis I can't comment further because it would be wrong for me to prejudge the outcome of that investigation which has been commissioned by the Chief Constable. Mr McCrossan. 
I thank the uh, Minister for her answer. I know the Minister will appreciate the seriousness of the allegations that are now on uh, the public record and it gives some concern to many. Uh, can the Minister give an assurance to this House that the investigation will be impartial, uh, it will be thorough and it will give a clear conclusion uh, to uh, these uh, matters and also uh, that uh, in, the, in the absence of uh, PSNA, PSNA officers in the community uh, that there was no one left wanting uh, when it came to tackling the issue that they made a face throughout this period of absence? Well, I mean, there are some assurances that I can give. I mean, I can give the assurance that certainly in my discussion with the Chief Constable, he takes the matter seriously, and therefore I would imagine as much as anyone else will want to see this dealt with thoroughly um, and properly investigated. But obviously the, the nature of the investigation, how it proceeds and the outcome of it um, are really a matter um, for the Chief Constable and will no doubt be, uh, will be looked into further um, by the Policing Board, which is the appropriate scrutiny mechanism um, for issues of this kind. Call Mr. Doug Beattie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I thank the Minister for her um, detailed statement. Um, and I join her in a huge appreciation for the prison service, who in many cases are, are forgotten about in this um, crisis that we're in. Uh, and it's testimony to their dedication and their work that we only have one prisoner who has um, tested positive for COVID-19 and only six staff. But I'd like to extrapolate that figure, if I can, please. So that one um, prisoner how many prisoners have actually been tested for COVID-19? Uh, and of those six staff, how many of our staff in total have been tested for COVID-19? Even a percentage, if we don't have a figure. Thank you. Well, we only started um, with the testing of staff um, in April um, as a result of discussions that I had with the health minister who has helped us be able um, to, to bring that forward. Um, in terms of the numbers, I would not be able to give you those numbers. I don't have access to those at the moment. Um, but it is done on the basis of the advice which comes from the Department of Health, which is that anyone um, who has symptoms um, ought to go and be tested. And that will be applied in exactly the same way uh, within a population in the prison as it would be applied in the population outside. And so any prison officer um, who is symptomatic or concerned about their health or is concerned that they, may, they or their family may have been exposed to the virus are able now to access checking. Anyone who is symptomatic is also, as you know, placed in isolation in order to ensure that if people do um, show signs um, that may suggest uh, COVID-19, such as a temperature um, or, or other symptom, that they are not in the main prison population and therefore are not putting others at risk. And those units are properly um, serviced in terms of the prison service with members in full PPE um, and able to ensure that those, are, those people are not being further exposed um, to the virus themselves when they work in that environment. Mr Beattie. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I mean, you can understand where I'm coming from on this because prisons are a micro society in many ways and, and that they are enclosed, but they are not isolated, there is, there is still a lot of foot, footfall and, and movement within that and therefore it's important to understand that percentage of who are being tested to give us a real understanding of how this um, uh, disease is moving through our prisons and our, our prison service because uh, I mean I've had an awful lot of lobbying at this moment about the training courses which are going on within the prisons because they have continued on but one of them now has been sent home because one of those trainees has tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, and that course has been stopped. Um, I don't know about the second course. It would be interesting to find out how we are with the second course. Um, but certainly the staff who are at Hyde Bankwood where the course was Question. taking place are concerned that they mix with those individuals who had that and have now been sent home. Can you give us any assurance on how we're dealing with that? Well, I can certainly give you assurance that we did not um, take lightly the decision to continue with training officers. However, if we are to ensure that there is a constant flow of officers into the system, as there is indeed a constant flow of officers out of the system due to retirement and other things, then we have to continue to train new officers um, to be able to deploy them in our prisons. Otherwise, we would be in a much more significant problem um, in terms of the ratio of officers um, to those in our care. With respect um, to the trainee um, who has contracted COVID-19, the normal procedures have been put in place and those um, who were who were 
close to that um, individual have been offered the option of, te of being able to be tested. Um, and so those, those procedures are in place as recommended by the Department of Health. Because remember, it's not for me as Justice Minister to decide what is the appropriate level of testing. It is a matter for the Health Minister to advise the Department as to how to test um, prisoners and indeed the, uh, the prison officers within the system. In terms of ensuring that our custodial environments um, are maintained safely, um, as you know, we introduced um, restricted high space regimes, proportionate social distancing measures. We restricted movement in access because you mentioned about it not being a closed system. Whilst it's not an entirely closed system, it's a much more closed system than it was before the pandemic. Um, we have shielded older and vulnerable prisoners. We have isolated anyone who is symptomatic. Um, and we have 14 day isolation for all new committals. We have reduced doubling up. We have stopped face to face visits from the 23rd of March. Um, and we've also suspended temporary release and working out in the community schemes. We have the early release scheme, as you already know. We've closed the learning and skills units. We've increased the allowances to try and support prisoners um, in terms of their television access and telephone credits in order to assist them um, with their occupation during the day. We have increased cleaning and the use of PPE in line with WHO and public health agency guidance. Um, and we are testing symptomatic prisoners and staff and their family member members in line with the defined criteria provided by the Department of Health. So I think we are doing all that we can. And I have to say, I think it is a tribute um, to how effective that has been in terms of prison management, that we can count on two hands the number of people who have tested positive within the system, both in terms of those who work in the prisons and also those who are resident in the prisons. And I think when you, can when you contrast it to other residential settings, I think we have done a pretty good job. And that's not to be complacent, because there could be an outbreak within the prison system at any time, and we're absolutely alert to that fact. Mr John Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I start by just briefly associating myself and my party with the condemnation uh, stated here today of those despicable threats against uh, politicians and journalists and say to all of those at the receiving end of those threats that we stand with you. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, as a member of the police and board, I'm aware that the PSNI enforcement of the coronavirus regulations um, is not the responsibility of the Minister and that she recognises the operational independence of the Chief Constable. But could I ask, uh, in addition to that, if the Minister would agree that we actually need to see individual responsibility and common sense in relation uh, to, to these regulations? And crucially, in addition to that, we also need to see consistent messaging from all departments and from all Ministers also. Well, I, I, I thank um, my colleague for his question, and I absolutely agree that we cannot expect the police to police our living rooms, our back gardens, um, and aspects of our private lives. We have to take responsibility um, for our own health and for the health of those around us, and also um, for the spread of this disease in the community. As I said earlier, I think that as we get more and more freedom to move, to go to work, to do all the things that we want to do, um, we are going to have to take more responsibility for making those difficult choices. And therefore, it's important that as an executive, we present people with clear, um, concise and easily understood information and guidance and consistent advice so that people feel confident in the decisions they take. This has been an unsettling time. People are frightened about the risk to themselves and their families. They desire to go back to work. They desire to be able to spend time with their friends, but they are fearful about the impact that might have on their health and the health of those around them. And so what we need to do is give people the confidence um, and the assurance that they feel able to make informed decisions about their behaviour in a way that will not jeopardise the progress that we've made. Mr Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And following on on the impacts of the coronavirus, uh, the Minister will be aware that, that my constituent, Fiona Jemison, and her daughter, uh, Kira Hindman, bravely went public about the, the impacts of stalking. Um, and I've referenced it here before also. Can I ask um, f from that, c can we have a reassurance that the introduction of legislation around stalking has not been adversely impacted by COVID-19? Well, I mean, I was fortunate enough to meet both Fiona and Kira before um, the, this pandemic um, and to be able to talk with them about their experiences, not only um, with respect to stalking, but also the response of the various parts of the justice system. And it was something that informed um, further my commitment um, to bring forward stalking legislation in the autumn. 
Obviously, all departments are under a degree of pressure in terms of juggling the various responsibilities they have, both in terms of the pandemic and also in terms of the wider responsibilities. But as, as you are aware, we were able to make good progress um, with respect to the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, which is now with the committee um, for their attention. And we, are, we have now moved in draft, to drafting um, the legislation that we hope to bring forward on stocking along the same timeline that we had originally intended. So I'm hopeful um, that we will be able to continue with that piece of work and with the committee's um, permission and cooperation um, be able to introduce that in the autumn. Call Mr Gordon. Don. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, I thank the Minister for her statement today. Does the Minister recognise the need for review in relation to the attendance at funerals? My understanding is the public are confused about standing out paying respects in the street, if that is a reasonable thing to do, and um, obviously uh, adhering to social distancing regulations. I think we need clarification on that. And I also understand that nowhere in the legislation is it the number 10 uh, specified in relation to attendance at graveyards. Perhaps we could get some further clarification on those issues, which are highly sensitive, highly emotive, and in Northern Ireland, people thankfully have respect for the dead. Well, I mean, first and foremost, I would have to say that I think I recognised in my opening remarks that it has been an incredibly difficult period for those who have lost a loved one, whether through COVID-19 or indeed any other disease at this time, to not be able um, to draw on the support um, of your family and friends at that time, to have to grieve in isolation, to not be able um, to give people a proper send-off, for want of a better um, way of putting it, um, I think is very difficult. And I think it is particularly difficult in a community where our, our form of grieving tends to be one that is very much a communal and community-led one, where it's not just about immediate family, but it's also about friends and about the extended community, about the church community and our, our other um, connections. And so it is very difficult. However, unfortunately, I can't provide you um, with that guidance because the regulations ultimately and the clarification of those regulations falls to the Department of Health. So it would be a matter that you would need to raise with the, the Health Minister in respect of what, if any, um, changes to the regulations are required um, in order to do that. But I think in the roadmap that has been set out by the Executive earlier this week, we have given some indication um, of, for example, outdoor gatherings of the kind of size and scale that we might be able to reach at, at different stages um, in this process. And we've also given some indication of indoor gatherings, obviously all contingent on appropriate social distancing, um, and we've given that indication too. But in the interim, the message remains as it was, and that is to try to abide by the, by the um, advice given um, and to bear in mind the importance that we're protecting the living as well as respecting the dead. Mr Dunn. Yes, thank you, Minister. And I think, as has been mentioned earlier, a common sense approach is, is important. My final point is just in relation to the crematorium. I'm sure you're very aware of the issue. Again, a highly sensitive issue that no member of the public is allowed into the chapel. Perhaps that issue, Minister, needs to be reviewed and reviewed urgently. I think small numbers, I think, would be reasonable. Well, again, I mean, this is a matter really for Belfast City Council that operates the crematorium, but I do have some insight into um, the rationale behind the current process. And so I'm happy, um, whilst not speaking on their behalf, to be able to give you some indication of why um, the limitations are there, because I think it is an area that is poorly understood. We have a very small staff in the crematorium, and we have only one crematorium facility in Northern Ireland. Um, given the risk of excess deaths and the possibility um, that they would have come under significant pressure, and also the risk to the staff who work in the crematorium from exposure um, to COVID-19 themselves, because some of the staff who work in the crematorium are either shielding or have staff or have family who shield. 
There was a concern at the outset that the crematorium's operations could be compromised were people to be able to attend in the crematorium, have contact with the staff who work in the crematorium, and potentially um, some of those people then would not be able um, to operate the, the, the crematorium facility. And the risk, of course, is that with very small numbers, it also takes a significant time to train someone um, to operate a crematorium, so it can take upwards of a year. So there was an issue about trying to ensure that we had the right capacity um, in terms of being able to deal um, with cremations as and when required, in the same way that some of the concerns around cemeteries were about protecting the staff who work there because they tend to operate on quite small staff. I do think as we move out of this phase, that will obviously be open for review. Um, but that gives a background to it. I don't think in any sense, shape or form, people were unaware of how difficult that would be. And I do know people who attended the crematorium and found it incredibly distressing to be turned back at the gate um, whilst their loved one made their last journey um, alone. And I think that is a difficult thing for people. Um, but there was a clear logic um, behind why it had to be done. Um, but I would hope we will not be in that situation um, in perpetuity. Call Ms Catherine Kelly. Mayor Goodlass, Ken Corlea. Thank you, Minister, for your statement. Minister, you have stated previously that you would cooperate, co cooperate with the Minister for Communities and other executive colleagues to put additional measures in place to support victims of domestic abuse during COVID-19. Can you outline specifically what work has been done to ensure adequate provision of emergency accommodation um, for victims who need it? Well, I thank the member for her question. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment with respect to emergency accommodation because that does fall entirely within the remit of the Department for Communities. But we have met um, with the Minister for Communities. Um, we have met with the First and Deputy First Minister. And I have supported a number of bids from the Department for Communities in terms of additional funding that's needed um, in order that accommodation can be provided. It's also important that that accommodation is sustained beyond the immediate crisis. So, for example, there were opportunities through closed guest houses, through closed hotels, to provide temporary accommodation, but it would be only that on a very temporary basis. Um, and the important thing for us was finding continuity of supply so that when people move away um, from a domestic um, abuse or violence situation, that they find themselves uh, with appropriate um, accommodation um, more widely. In terms of the work um, that we have been able to do, um, the police are monitoring high-risk victims and providing them with the signposting necessary so they can access key services and support. Um, and the helpline, which we jointly, uh, which we're jointly involved with funding with the Department for Communities, has a range of measures in place um, to, in, to deal with the increase in calls that they're receiving at this time and also being able um, to pass those on. The police lead the multi-agency operational response um, in the voluntary and community sector, and so accommodation is a particular focus for them. And they have been working with the Department for Communities because there has been some increased um, accommodation secured. The other area of work um, that has started is also with uh, the Department for Infrastructure. Um, and Minister Mallon and I met yesterday to discuss the possibility of being able to extend emergency transport um, to those um, who need to leave the situation using our public transport network. You don't have to take a supplementary. Would you like a supplementary? Yep. Just a short one. That's um, Minister, um, I take on board what you've said, but in relation to uh, victims in rural areas like West Tyrone, is there any um, particular measures being put into place there where emergency accommodation is very short in supply? Um, and a lot of people um, have very little, um, you know, some people may live miles and miles from neighbours and friends. Um, if you could outline if there's any measures um, in relation to that. Thank you. Well, I mean, obviously there are particular issues in terms of rurality and how people can access services that are provided. And those, those stand regardless of the pandemic. But they're exacerbated by the fact, I guess, that people are limited. Um, in terms of their ability to move and to access um, other services within their local community. It is a valid reason, and it was included in the original regulations, to leave your property and to travel um, for purposes of, of fleeing domestic abuse or violence, and it is a valid reason also 
um, for people to leave their home and go to work in the context of providing advice and guidance or working in a hostel for those, for example, um, who are subject to domestic abuse. But the Minister for Communities would be the person who would be best placed in terms of the detail of accommodation, because that's not something that I would be directly involved in, though I do support the Department for Communities in terms of um, funding the helpline that would signpost people to that accommodation once they contact it. We've also looked very carefully at this time when people may be at home with their abuser to ensure that other methods other than simply a phone call are available, so things like online chat, things like email um, and so on are available so that people can reach out um, without having to speak out because that's not always possible um, in the confined space of somebody's home where the abuser is present. Before I call the next member, I just have a housekeeping announcement. The statement from the Minister for Health has been issued. Uh, in the table pack and should be accessible um, from your uh, devices. And again, uh, everyone has availed of the opportunity for uh, a supplementary. It's not necessary to use them all. Um, I call, and this is no pressure for her not to, I call Dr. Kiva Archibald. <laughs> Um, and I'd like to thank the, the Minister for her statement today as well. Um, Minister, a number of constituents have expressed concerns around not being able to access the family court um, for care arrangements for children. Um, and obviously there is guidance in place around that. But can the Minister clarify she has been lobbied on this issue specifically and what work is being done to ensure social services, family, statutory agencies and voluntary agencies um, involved in the process know about and understand the guidance? Thank you. Um, with respect to access to family courts, um, as you know, the Lord Chief Justice um, has put in place um, particular arrangements in order that those who need to access changes, for example, um, to uh, contact, um, are able to do that. It isn't a simple situation, I have to say, and it is a very stressful one. Um, I think where parental relationships are good um, and flexibility is shown, then what you will find is that those locally agreed arrangements um, are not open to objection. And there is a recognition, for example, that normal contact can continue. So if you have shared, um, if you've shared um, custody, there is no reason why the child can't move between parents and so on, and that has all been clarified. However, I think where there is a pre-existing issue um, around the relationships between the parents, um, it becomes much more fraught and much more difficult. Um, it is primarily because of the, um, the use of, for example, contact centres in many of those cases, an issue for the Department of Health who manage both the family policy and also um, the contact centres themselves. However, where contact needs to be revised, it is possible for that to be done through the court, either through an administrative procedure uh, where people are willing to agree um, or through um, the legal representatives of each of, of the parents. The, Bottom line for everyone involved um, in the system um, is that they want to put the needs of the child first and the safety of the child first. And I think that that is always the intention within the family court system, and that hasn't changed, though the mechanism of accessing justice um, has obviously altered during the pandemic. Call Mr Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'll try and be uncharacteristically brief in my questions. Um, Thank you to the Minister for coming and giving us this update. She correctly said in her um, uh, remarks uh, that with great choice comes great re with, with choice comes responsibility. She's correct to say that in terms of how people approach um, as we move through this and easing restrictions. She also said it's a lot of this in terms of um, police management is an operational delivery for the Chief, Chief Constable. That's true. But will she agree and will she work with him on a programme of public communication which sets out what the police is doing? A lot of people think the police have been very good uh, in managing the situation uh, since March. They've been even they've been judicious. They've been restrained. There's been community buy-in. As much for the police as for anyone else, it's really important that they clearly communicate what they can and can't do. Well, first of all, I, I agree, and I want to thank you um, for the fact that I think that is reflective of how most people see how the police have, have handled what is an unprecedented situation in that they are policing public health regulations as opposed to public order issues, and that is a rather strange space for the police to find themselves in. However, I think in terms of clarity, that really 
bluntly has to come from us um, as leadership um, in terms of what people can and can't do. The role of the police is only really to guide people around um, ensuring that they continue to comply with what the executive has asked. Um, and as I say, and so I think that as we move through the different stages, the five stages, um, it will become less and less either feasible for the police um, to have an enforcement role or indeed um, appropriate for the police to have that role. I think people will have to assume more and more of that responsibility for themselves. But I think it's important that at each stage, the executive set out very clearly what it is we require of people, uh, what it is in terms of guidance and advice we can offer people. And I think that includes um, both the support and the guidance of the police. Because remember, a lot of their work has been involved in engaging and educating and encouraging, not just on enforcement. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I just ask, it in, in supplement to that, um, if she has had discussions with uh, colleagues on the other side of the border? I know the Garda Shia Khan and the PSNI are working relatively well together, but there has been this outstanding issue about whether the guards are able to enforce regulations in the Republic. I'm not sure precisely what the position is here in terms of residents from the South. Now, it may be that enforcement is less of an issue, but certainly in terms of managing information and people being on the same page, clearly we will have fairly soon, hopefully, a position where NI residents may be going into Donegal. We may even have people shopping from the south and Sainsbury's and Uri again. How is she going about managing that and discussing with her counterparts? I think that there has been a shared understanding and cooperation um, between both Angarda Shikana and the Police Service of Northern Ireland um, over recent weeks. There's been good engagement. I have also engaged um, with the Justice and Equalities Minister um, to discuss with him, for example, shared approaches when it came to the bank holiday weekends, which are, all, I think, always a testing period. To be clear, and the message, I think, has been quite clear, if your essential journeys take you across the border, that is fine. There is no problem. You can cross the border as you always would if you live in a border community and your essential journey takes you across the border. So, you know, if you live in Straban and your essential journey takes you to Lifford, that's not a problem. And I think we need to be realistic that that's the case and no one's trying to stop that happening. However, if you're on a jaunt for a day out and you think that by going across the border you can get away with it, I think you will find yourself turned back um, by one of the two um, police services um, on this island. And I think that that is appropriate because it is again about respecting the fact that as we move, as we have contact with different people, as we move from place to place and from, from community to community, we increase the risk of carrying the virus with us and spreading it to places where it has otherwise not been. And so I think we do have to approach that with a degree of sensitivity, particularly I have to say, in some of our smaller rural seaside communities who feel under considerable pressure if they get an influx of townies who want to make off for the weekend, buy everything in the shops, um, put the local services under pressure, and potentially bring um, COVID-19 into the village with them. That's how it's going to be perceived. And there has to be sensitivity and respect, um, I think, as we move forward in, her, in terms of how we manage that. Mr. Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, Minister, I concur totally uh, with the tribute you paid to the PSNI within your statement. Uh, the police did have a particularly difficult task at the commencement of the new regulations, uh, especially having to deal with very close uh, scrutiny from uh, some sections of the media. Uh, there were early concerns flagged up to me around a lack of PPE for individual police officers, uh, but I acknowledge that this has now been largely sorted out. Um, my question to the Minister is, is she aware of any advice uh, that is in place to maximise social distancing within police vehicles being deployed uh, in routine patrols, if indeed this is possible? Um, well, I, I thank the member for his question. I think it is incredibly difficult within any vehicle to be able to maximise social distancing. But the Chief Constable has obviously been looking very carefully at how people are deployed in order to minimise um, the impact um, that they might have. Um, for example, at the beginning, there were COVID-19 cars that were deployed in each area so that if um, someone was at risk, they could deploy a, a car with full PPE um, in order to deal with those situations, as opposed to having every officer. Um, because as you will appreciate, PPE, whilst it is important in terms of protection, it is uncomfortable um, for those who have to wear it and not something that people can drive around wearing on a constant basis or do their jobs effectively wearing all the time. There are limitations on that. I think it's one of the things that we need to recognise that it is not the case that in all spheres of life, 
full social distancing is possible um, or has been possible throughout this. It's the same in prisons, and those of you who have been in prisons, um, either as visitors or otherwise, will be familiar um, with the rather constrained, um, the rather constrained environment that we're dealing with. They're, they're, they're quite small areas, and so again, you try to do it in a proportionate way to the environment that you're in. But it is one of the reasons why I pay tribute to those who work in the front line, because there are people day in, day out who are putting themselves and their own health in a degree of risk, albeit that managed risk. Um, in order that we are able to go about relatively normal lives, even in the case of lockdown. And I think we should be very grateful to them for that. With respect to the scrutiny that they get from the media, I have to say that some of the, um, some of the original stories that emerged in, in the media after full investigation by the PSNI, I'm assured, really don't bear scrutiny to reality. So I think there also has to be a degree of caution on our part um, that sometimes things that happen in other places suddenly seem to transpose themselves into our situation and the police are held accountable for perhaps what people have done elsewhere rather than here. But I, I'm confident that the Chief Constable is making every possible effort to keep officers safe and with respect to PPE, there is a constant review of that and good supplies. We're not going to be complacent about it. We will need it for a long time to come either as visitors or otherwise. If elected politics fails, the diplomatic service definitely beckons for the minister. I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. I thank the minister for her statement today. Minister, at the close of your statement, you pay tribute to the PSNI who played a key role in policing the, corner, the, the uh, virus um, uh, uh, restriction regulations. And since the lockdown, you will be aware of three Republican funerals that took place where hundreds of people gathered, blatantly flouting the law and placing other people's lives at risk. Therefore, as Justice Minister, can I ask you for your assessment of the PSNI's response to these uh, incidences that took place? Well, again, I would have to say that these are matters that are operational matters for the Chief Constable. However, I'm aware that as often happens when large crowds gather, whether it be a public order or indeed a public health situation, the police um, sought to gather evidence on any offences that may be being, um, may be being committed. Um, and have continued with their investigations, and I believe um, that files have been passed to the Public Prosecution Service, and it would therefore be inappropriate for me to comment on the individual cases. However, I will say this. A number of members have referred to how difficult it is um, when someone dies and we are not there um, and able to have a funeral um, and to say our last farewell in the way we would wish. And a lot of families have sacrificed that in order to protect the community around them. So they have foregone the right to be able to gather, to be able to um, say, their, to pay their respects, because they believe that protecting their community is important. And I think it compounds their pain when others flout the law in the way that they do, and so publicly, because I think it would be, it would be harmful um, to anyone to see some and behave in a way that is completely contradictory um, to the way that others have been willing to do. And I want to pay tribute to those who have stuck by the regulations, despite how painful it is, for their generosity and their graciousness in doing that. And we owe them a debt of gratitude too, in terms of curtailing the spread. Because those who ignore the regulations are not only being reckless with their own health and the health of those around them, but they're almost definitely ensuring that there will be future funerals that they will need to attend. Um, by behaving in such a reckless manner. And I think they need to desist um, and take seriously the advice that's given in terms of large gatherings. Thank the Minister for her response. And can I ask, has, uh, as Justice Minister, ha have you had any discussions with the Chief Constable around these uh, particular matters? Um, with respect to obviously the operational management of such gatherings, it would not be appropriate for me um, to uh, be engaging with the Chief Constable, but I have obviously um, on my weekly stock take with the Chief Constable throughout this um, sought his, his advice, his guidance um, and his insight into how these are going to be managed. It's also worth saying that where there are large funerals anticipated that the police have proactively engaged with communities, um, have talked to families. Um, and many of those families, on reflection, have sought to reduce the number of people attending. 
um, and comply with the regulations. And so again, it's about engaging and encouraging people to think where there may be a risk of harm, um, that they'll, they'll behave appropriately. Um, but it is ultimately in terms of how it's policed. And I think we would all recognise that it wouldn't really do anyone's reputation any good um, for the police to be seen to go in and disrupt a funeral. I think people would find that difficult. But I do think it is appropriate and proportionate that they collect information about offences and, and seek to prosecute them if appropriate afterwards. Before I call the next speaker, there are nine more people who have indicated to me that they wish to speak. If I was applying the rules strictly and this was going to last an hour, there would be 12 minutes remaining, and that means people further down the list wouldn't get in. I, I will do my best to ensure that everyone gets asking a question, but it is not my intention to keep the minister here for an hour and a half. I don't think that would be fair. So can we please focus? I call Mr John O'Dowd. And in regards to the previous question, I think if Mr Buchanan was being honest with himself and reflecting over himself, he would realise that large funerals have not only taken place among the Republican community. In fact, I think if he was honest with himself, he could think of one very close. So in relation to our question, Minister, I want to return to the domestic abuse issue. And the Minister has referred to the increase in calls to the helpline and also to the police, which we have to accept as a grave underestimation, even in terms of the abuse that's going on in society. There's much talk of recovery, uh, the economic recovery, the health recovery. Will the Minister outline, is there any discussions taking place within our department as to how we help those who are suffering domestic abuse at any time, but certainly during this period, recover in the future? Well, I thank the member for his question, and also I think it is right to say that there have been gatherings and not only funerals um, in a number of places, and I think it's right to reflect um, that all of those gatherings, for whatever purpose, are reckless. Um, in terms of how we recover the justice system, I think that there are a number of things. I mean, first and foremost, um, I think that the support that we offer people during the pandemic will matter. So the quality of the advice and support and guidance that we're able to give them at this time, the ability for people um, to be able to um, leave the family home in cases where um, there, there is domestic abuse or violence is hugely important. But I think we would also expect that there will be a lag in terms of the reporting of this. Um, we know that, for example, often the first signs of domestic or indeed sexual violence in the home comes when people are at school and changes in behaviour are noted. And many young people now are not in that environment and therefore are not subject to the kind of supervision that they would normally have. And so I think what we may see is a rise in terms of reporting of incidents of a quite serious nature going forward. We have to balance that against the fact that we also have some quite significant and serious cases that were in the system. We know, for example, um, that sexual crime um, takes a very long time to reach the stage where it enters the courts. Um, and that now has been lengthened even further, and yet the attrition rates in terms of witnesses is huge. So there are massive challenges, and I think through the Criminal Justice Board, through working with the Lord Chief Justice, um, through working with the court system and others, um, we are seeking to try to prioritise those cases um, in order that there is a proper plan to move out from this. The leadership around that element in terms of the, the prosecution of offences will come from the Lord Chief Justice and his staff, um, but his engagement, I think, with other members of the legal profession, uh, with the department um, and so on, has been absolutely critical in terms of planning a way forward. In terms of the support and guidance, um, there is, I think, um, at the moment, and I don't want to announce anything on behalf of another minister, but there are ongoing discussions in terms of additional resource that may be available um, for those who are more vulnerable at this time in terms of support and guidance, and I think more about that will become clear um, when today's executive finally concludes. I call Mr Andrew Muir. Um, thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the consequences of COVID-19 have put a real strain on the public finances. Is the Minister content with that there are sufficient resources been allocated to her uh, department and also the justice delivery partners as well? Well, I think all of us are at this stage aware of the, if you like, the, the dual challenge. I mean, first of all, there will be things that we had anticipated we would do that we will now not be able to do. There will be other things um, that we have had to do that we did not anticipate having to do. 
So we have to balance the finances across both of those. COVID-19, um, by and large, in terms of the Department of Finance, has been dealt with as a separate item um, to the normal budgeting process. But we have now been asked to engage, along with other ministers, um, on a review um, of our budgets to look to see where potentially savings could be made um, and, if you like, money that will not be spent in this year, because it's hugely important that we don't return money um, to Treasury at a time when we have ongoing pressures within departments. And so that is happening right across the executive. And when that comes to fruition, we will have a much clearer picture um, in terms of the allocation of resources. At this point, um, of course, there are pressures within the department, and we have been very open with the committee um, and with the Department of Finance about those. Not all of those will crystallise in this year, and so it would be inappropriate, um, I think, for us to be making um, requests to the Department of Finance for those at this time. However, where we have required additional resource, um, where we have been able to provide a clear case for that, um, the Department of Finance have responded appropriately. Mr. Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, where some of that additional resource was provided was for the temporary rest in place at Kinnegar in my own constituency. And we obviously hope that that will not be required. Uh, but there was a plans being developed by the uh, Council, and I would declare that I'm previously a member of ARDS in North Down Borough Council, to develop a master plan for that area. And just want to see if the Minister could outline what the future intentions are in terms of that facility. At this stage, um, <clears throat> no decision has been made um, about the, the temporary resting place, but as you will be aware, um, the site came to the department as a result of an, a request for military aid, um, and so was essentially um, given to us by, um, by the MOJ. Um, we would want to look at options in terms of whether or not the facility could be stood down after this crisis, whether it would be retained um, and how that would be managed. And at the moment, um, we would hope that it would not be used, but we are not out of the pandemic yet. And so we have to remain in a state of readiness. And the police have agreed that if it needs to be stepped up to be used during this pandemic, um, that they are happy and content to continue to run it. In terms of the longer term approach, um, I think it would be too early to speculate as to how the executive might want to take that forward. But I have to say that as a regional facility for emergency situations, um, it is probably second to none in these islands. Thomas Pam Cameron. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement to the House. Um, I am also wanting to ask her uh, around the issue of domestic and sexual violence. And she stated in her statement that 10 per cent increase in reports to the PSNI and 35% increase to calls to the 24-hour domestic and sexual um, violence helpline in the most recent week. So can the Minister detail what additional support her department will be providing to third sector organisations such as Our Glass, Women's Aid, Men's Advisory Project, given their inability to fundraise in their normal or traditional ways? Um, and how then will their services be assured to be there when they're most needed, when victims are effectively released um, and then able to seek that help that they require? Um, well, I, I thank the member um, for the question. Yeah, I mean, I think since the, there has been a slight increase um, in the reporting of incidents during COVID-19 to the police, but there has been a much more dramatic increase in the number of calls. And I think we need to consider what those calls might entail. For some, it will be seeking advice and guidance on behalf of someone that they're concerned about, um, rather than as a report of an individual offence or something that has happened. Um, and so we need to balance that out. And we won't really, I don't believe, see the full picture um, of this. But we do know for some time, but we do know um, by looking across other countries who have been in this kind of lockdown situation, um, that domestic violence has increased. And we saw the evidence of that in terms of some of the most violent incidents um, that have been reported um, and brought to the attention of the police. In terms of how we support those organisations, um, the department, as you know, has a specific role around justice. So we fund jointly the helpline um, and we have ensured that they are able to have the support necessary to be able to continue to train additional staff um, and so on. But the main stay of their support around um, advice and counselling, for example, comes from the Department for Health. Um, and the other part of their funding around 
um, the helpline, but also around, if you like, their wider remit would come from the Department for Communities. It is a very complex picture, and I mean, I, I realise as I stand here that most of the time when I get up and say, um, well, I can answer part of that question, but there are three or four other ministers involved, it's probably quite frustrating. The reality is that it is a complex landscape, particularly around family law, around um, family justice, and also around domestic abuse. But on the positive side, what it does show is that there is good cross-departmental working, I think, despite um, the fact that very often what we see in the press is quite to the contrary um, in terms of how our working together and our relationships are reported. I think one of the positives that I have seen in this work um, is the ability of people from all different party political backgrounds to pull together on this issue. Mr. Pat Shane. Uh, I got a free last con quill of Spuega Selection Ara. So all right, just thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her statement today. Uh, the statement tells us that 142 prisoners have been released as part of the temporary release scheme. And that scheme was set up on a three-month rolling basis, so more prisoners should be due for release next month. Can the Minister tell us uh, if uh, in the light of the executive exit strategy? Uh, and possible easing of restrictions. Are there going to be any changes to this scheme? Gormagod. Well, it would be my intention um, to review this again at the end of the month, as I did at the end of last month. Um, first of all, to judge whether or not there is a need to continue um, with the release of prisoners. That will have to be balanced, um, as I said, very carefully in considering, for example, um, the number of prison officers who are available, the number of prisoners in the system, including new committals, um, uh, to, to, the, to the prison system um, and ensuring that there is a safe balance um, as, uh, maintained within the prison system. Um, so it's not something that I could say yes or no on at this point in time because it will depend on a number of factors which won't become apparent um, until the point of the review. In terms of how the scheme operates, I think the scheme has operated successfully. Um, we took very swift action and decisive action at the beginning. And I think that that has helped us to maintain not just um, the healthy um, levels that we've had in the presence in terms of people's health and well-being, but it has also, I think, helped improve morale, um, both within prison service um, and also um, within the prisoner population. Um, because I think that things like overcrowding um, and the lack of routine regime that people would have been um, would normally have, have had does have an impact um, in terms of people's mental health and well-being. And so I think that being able to reduce the prison population to a point where we are able to reintroduce some elements um, of regime to the prison is actually really important um, in terms of taking care of people and supporting them in their rehabilitation through the system. Mr. Shane. Hi, uh, Gordon Mayogut. Thank you, Minister. And uh, just by coincidence, uh, in front of the Health Committee this morning, we heard uh, Professor Martin McKee, uh, formerly from this parish, and he was talking about uh, institutional amplifiers. Now, that uh, discussion was in the context of care homes and what's happening there at the minute. But he also mentioned the fact that prisoners or prisons can also be institutional amplifiers. And can, can I ask you, Minister, have you satisfied yourself in relation to the adequacy of preparedness and contingency plans in the event of a serious outbreak of COVID-19 in the prisons? Graham Elgott. Yes, I have, um, and I would not want to sound complacent in that regard because I think that realistically when people live at close quarters um, in densely populated residential settings, when a virus enters that setting, it is incredibly difficult to control. However, I am confident with the measures that have been taken thus far and that they have protected us. Um, the, only, the only positive test that we have had of a prisoner for COVID-19 is someone who was actually tested before committal. Um, we have not um, seen anyone within the system um, have to be, for example, removed because they've been seriously ill and requiring treatment, which would indicate that the work that has been done in terms of isolation, in terms of deep cleaning, um, and in terms of how we have managed the, the move of people through the system um, has been effective in containment um, and ensuring that, that COVID-19 has not entered the system um, and where there is risk of entry, that that entry is managed um, in, in, a, in the proper way. Um, I, I do think that we can't, we can't overstate the, the risk that there is when you are in those situations, but I'm confident um, that the prison service have done all in their power 
And whether that is sufficient for members or not, more importantly, I think the fact that both the President and Ombudsman um, and also um, the Criminal Justice Inspectorate have visited the prisons and satisfied themselves um, that they are content with how the prisons are operating during this period should provide reassurance both to those in our care and to their families um, who may be worried about their health and well-being. We're now <clears throat> almost five minutes over the hour uh, that the Minister has been here. Um, I'll allow this to run until 14.55 because I see outside the chamber is the Health Minister waiting to make a statement, his statement as well. So I'm sorry, folks, but it is what it is. I call Mr Justin McNulty. Guru Amai Yogic, I lost Colin Corla. And can I join with, with uh, fellow members in condemning the threats uh, to my fellow Arm County Armagh native, uh, Ms Linda Dillon, um, threats and intimidation from... Mr McNulty, no preambles. Questions, please. Threats and intimidation were wrong in the past and they're wrong now. Thank the Minister for her statements um, and for her answers thus far. And I applaud the Minister for her work in bringing forward legislation to tackle domestic abuse. I also welcome the clarification to Matthew O'Toole on border communities. The Minister is responsible for policing and the PSNI. And in her statement, the key role of policing the coronavirus restriction regulations Mr. Um, was alluded to. Spit it out. It's coming. Was alluded to. The Minister would be aware of the, the, the debate in many of our local authorities um, around the reopening of regulation or re recycling centres, recycling centres that are not uh, are vital for maintaining public health and it discourages the now all too common practice of fly tipping. To date, four local authorities have asked their, their centres to open, allowed their centres to open. More are to follow in the coming days but are waiting to hear from the Minister, the PSNI and the Executive. Can the Minister provide much needed clarity on this issue? Is a trip to the recycling, issue, the recycling centre to dispose of waste an essential journey? And will okay, the Minister has got your such? question. Minister? It's not for me to provide that clarity. It's a matter um, for the Department for Agriculture in terms of the guidance to councils and a matter for the police in terms of enforcement. I call Mr Robbie Butler. Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be well aware that before COVID happened, uh, the, probably the biggest epidemic in prisons was mental health. We have the South Eastern Trust providing that care. Would you be satisfied that that is not being amplified at the moment through the COVID threat? I, mental health is a massive issue. 35 per cent of the people who come into the prison system um, have pre-existing uh, pre mental health conditions, and caring for those people within the system is a, is a huge challenge in many cases. Um, we continue um, to have support from the South Eastern Health Trust um, in terms of being able to care for those who are most vulnerable. We also have a range of helplines that are available, and we have, particularly during this period, introduced things like virtual visiting so that we can maintain people's um, mental health and well-being through contact with other people. Um, it, is a very, it is a very complex area, but the support is there. And one of the reasons why it was so important to reduce the prison population was so that those who are at particular risk can have the proper supervision that is required um, when their lives may be at risk and are in danger. Commissioner Rachel Woods. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for coming here today. She noted that testing has been available for frontline staff who needed it from the 7th of April. Can the Minister confirm who she means by frontline staff in relation to the statement? And is it within anybody within the DOJ family or just the prison service? With respect to the statement that I made about the 7th of April, um, it was those who were in the front line, so for example, prison service, um, and also um, those who work in the police service um, who were able to access um, that, that testing, um, but others who have a frontline role, so um, those who would be working, if you like, in a civil service capacity, but in a frontline role, um, that is now being considered, I think, for rollout by the executive. I call Mr Jim Allister. Minister, uh in due course, there will be inquests arising from COVID deaths, particularly of health service workers. Can I ask you for an assurance that the outrageous direction given in England by the chief coroner that uh, coroners should not allow investigations into the uh, quantity of PPE provision or the quality of PPE provision, that those matters should not be dealt with in inquest, whereas our system is different, so far as it is within your power, will you give an assurance that no such restriction will be placed in our inquest? 
Um, I can't give a full. I, I can't obviously give you um, a full assurance on that because, as you said, it is only within limited um, part of my scope. However, I believe that the the purpose of an inquest is to determine the cause of death. Uh, what happens beyond that in terms of an investigation of negligence, um, whether that be criminal um, negligence or otherwise, um, is is a more complex matter um, than the determination of the cause of death. So, Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her statement. Um, it's obviously very concerning to hear the reports about the increase in domestic violence. Um, strictly speaking, Mr. Wells, this is a committee meeting rather than a plenary session, so I'm not certain that points of order are appropriate. But I'll hear your I'll hear your point. You will get asking your question, you. Mr. Carroll. Yes. Mr. Mr. Carroll was making a very important point. A member walked in front of him which is extremely off-putting and rude. Will you rule that that is not acceptable? Yes, I will. That is not acceptable. The member is right. Uh, members should not walk in front of other members when they're speaking. Mr Wells is quite right, and the rules are very clear on that. I call Mr Jerry Carroll. Thank you. Um, and for us, I didn't even notice that I was asking my question, but uh, um, <laughs> to be completely frank, um, it's obviously very concerning uh, to get back to my question to hear reports about the increase uh, in domestic violence and increased calls uh, to the 24 hour abuse um, helpline. Um, and figures uh, are on the rise, but they may not be the full picture, as obviously people may not report it out of fear. Um, has the Minister's Department done any work into the feasibility of taking control of empty hotel rooms in this period uh, to support those who, um, for staying at home, is the most dangerous uh, place to be, such as Belgium and other countries have done these uh, measures? So, any work, has any work from our department been commissioned into that? Thank you. Um, to be clear, it wouldn't be for the Department of Justice to do so, but in discussions with the Department for Communities, um, a number of those issues have been explored. Um, I think the wider challenge um, with respect to this is ensuring that there is a sustainable way forward in terms of accommodation, because if we put people up in temporary accommodation, we are obviously there's a time limit to that. We need to ensure that there is then a flow of permanent accommodation that people can move to afterwards. And I also want to stress again, and I think it's important that I do so, that it should not always be those who are subjected to domestic abuse and violence who have to leave the home. It should not be for them to be disrupted in their way of life. And there are measures in place, legal measures in place, that people can take to ensure that the abuser is removed from the home. Um, and for example, the Department of Communities and Housing Executive do very good work in terms of creating a sanctuary in the home so that people can remain in their own home safely and within their community and their support networks. I think that that's a really vital piece of work that needs to be done and is a sustainable way to ensure that families are not broken up from the people around them because of one abusive person um, who then manages just to inherit the family home. I thank the Minister for coming to the committee and uh, for making the statement and answering questions. I apologise to people further down the list, particularly my friend from Urien Armagh, if he thought I was a bit brusque with him. But I, I do think where you have a, a government, we have a government that has five parties in it, I do think it's really important that Ms Woods, Mr Alistair and Mr Carroll do get asking their questions. And so uh, I hope members will forgive me if they thought I went a bit hard on them. Um, that concludes questions on the statement. Uh, we shall now have a, a brief suspension uh, for about 10 minutes prior to the next statement from the Minister for Health. I would remind all members about the importance of maintaining social distancing when leaving the chamber. The meeting will resume in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item three is a statement from the Minister of Health. The Speaker received notification on the 7th of May that the Minister wished to make a statement to the ad hoc committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your tabled pack at page three. I'd like to welcome the Minister for Health, Mr. Robin Swan, to this meeting of the committee. I will invite the Minister to make his statement, which should be heard by members without interruption and following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for them to ask questions. I call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for accepting my request to address the committee here again today. I welcome this opportunity, and I am keen to ensure openness and transparency and clear communication with you as elected representatives and with those you represent in relation to the management of the ongoing emergency. 
I can assure you that my department is doing all that it can, along with the support of those in the whole health and social care system, and with my executive colleagues, to manage the impact of COVID-19 and mitigate its worst effects. And in that, I and those battling every day with this disease are reliant on the continued goodwill and cooperation of the public and seeking to protect each other from the spread of this disease and protect the capacity of our frontline services. You will have seen the changes made to the regulations which have come into effect in England in recent days, and you will have also seen the Executive's plan for how Northern Ireland transitions into a new phase of recovery. Let me state once more that our approach to the easing of restrictions will be guided by science and not by the calendar. In these challenging times, the only thing we can say with certainty is that moving too swiftly to ease certain restrictions risks throwing away the progress we have all united to achieve in recent weeks. I would like nothing more than to be able to tell everyone that everything is going to be all right and that the worst is all behind us. We have achieved much in recent weeks, and I am proud of the response of our health and social care workers in particular, and a better place is in sight. I wish to give members an update today on the recent developments with regard to surge planning and the initial work being undertaken by my department with regards to recovery. As part of the preparations for the first wave, our priority was to ensure that the health and care system had sufficient capacity to deal with the rising numbers of COVID-19 patients. During March and April, critical care units across Northern Ireland implemented the Regional Critical Care Surge Plan, providing the capacity for the system to significantly increase critical care capacity. With the number of COVID-19 patients requiring critical care maintaining a gradual downward trend, my department has taken the decision to reduce the escalation level for critical care to low surge. As members will be aware, the Belfast City Hospital Tarn Block was designated Northern Ireland's Nightingale Hospital for the first wave. And due mainly to the commitment of HSC staff and the positive impact of social distancing, the Nightingale has not been required to deliver its full capacity and will be stood down. That is good news. It also allows for the reintroduction of urgent surgery and a range of other key services to be delivered from the tar block. I wish to assure members that the system will retain sufficient additional beds to continue to deliver care for COVID-19 positive patients in the coming months. The Nightingale will continue to be part of the region's flexible plan to re-escalate if modelling suggests further waves. Reducing the escalation level will ensure that the HSC has the capacity to release and redeploy some capacity to enable the resumption of urgent surgery and treatment. I recognise the severe impact that COVID-19 has had on a range of key services, including essential services such as cancer screening and treatments. This pandemic has similarly thrown our already horrendous waiting times into further turmoil. That is why I already have tasked officials to urgently develop a comprehensive recovery plan. And I must warn this House, whilst the immediate impact of COVID has been awful, the long-term impact will also be terrible. It will require serious efforts and serious financial commitment to try to fix some of the damage that has been done. However, when it comes to restarting key services, I really hope and expect that the Assembly and the Executive are not found lacking with either. I am also keen that we consider the extent to which innovation and new delivery models developed during the emergency response can be incorporated as we resume and develop health and social care services. It is critically important to recognise that this will not be a return to business as usual. COVID-19 will be with us for some time. But it must be remembered that since I last addressed this committee two weeks ago, more of our citizens have lost their lives to this terrible disease. As of today, the total number of fatalities across all sectors stands at 454. And I would like to reassure members that this figure does include deaths, not only in hospitals, but also care homes, at home and in community settings. There is understandably significant focus on the reporting of all deaths, but especially those in our care homes. The RQIA are reporting weekly figures with regard to the numbers of death in nursing and residential care homes. The latest figures, when compared to the same period, during both 2018 and 2019, indicates that the number of deaths are falling across the sector, 
with spikes reported around the 21st and 27th of April 2020. The official source of information in relation to deaths is NISRA, however. And whilst recognising the absolutely need for data to be accurate, I also want it to be timely. That is why earlier this week I wrote to NISRA asking them to consider moving beyond its currently weekly bulletin on deaths to instead publication twice a week or more. This morning I received a response from NISRA declining that request. However, it is something I still want to continue to pursue. Every life lost too early is a tragedy, and there has been much focus on statistics and percentages. And I know I don't need to remind anyone in this House that behind every figure was someone who was loved and is now deeply missed. And whilst it is right to recognise that were it not for the heroic work of our health and social care workers and the tremendous sacrifices made by everyone across Northern Ireland, the number of deaths we would be facing would be many times worse. This is of no consolation to those who have been bereaved and who have not been able to mourn them as they would choose to do so. Once again, my deepest condolences go to their friends and families. I will now take some time to update you on the latest developments and the approach I have adopted to deal with this emergency, and to outline some of the significant actions that have been key to my response. Testing continues to be a vital tool in our response to this COVID-19 pandemic. And as of this morning, the total number of individual tests processed by our own local HSC labs now stands at 43,835. That's almost a further 11,500 tests that have been carried out locally as part of our national testing programme. As of today, we have tested 13,025 healthcare workers, and that is a central reason why we have such a low staff absence rate. The latest figures from Monday show that there were 304 staff off across the Trusts due to COVID-19, with a further 2,042 absent due to self-isolation, many of which would be shielding. Combined, that is 3.2 per cent of the entire workforce that are working so courageously on the front line. Through our work with a number of key stakeholders and delivery partners across the HSC system, local universities and industry, we plan to further significantly increase our testing capacity. This expansion is being overseen by the Department's Expert Advisory Group on Testing and is delivered in close co collaboration with our expert virology team. As a priority, we are further expanding our testing programme in care homes. Testing has been expanded on a phased basis, and the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service is now providing a mobile testing service to assist care home staff and trust teams who support care homes. This expansion of testing is additional to the testing currently undertaken in homes where there is an outbreak or cluster of infections, when all staff and residents are tested. And on the significant issue of support for care homes, I'd like to take a few moments to update you on the wide range of measures being deployed in Northern Ireland to protect care home residents during the COVID-19 pandemic. The number of homes with a confirmed outbreak stands at 75 with a further 32 suspected. However, let me also highlight that there are now 27 closed outbreaks. Whilst it's not easy through the heroic effort of homes, the residents, their carers and cleaners, it is possible to get COVID out of the home. I would also remind members that for every home with either a confirmed or suspected outbreak, there are three that don't. Whilst I am loath to draw comparisons, this does, does compare much more favourably to other parts of these islands. Yet there is no doubt at all that care homes have been seriously impacted by this disease. Our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland and across the UK have had similar distressing experiences, and I want to emphasise that extensive support has been and is continuing to be provided to the care home sector. The Department, Board, PHA, Trusts and RQA are all playing their part, and we are constantly seeking ways to enhance and intensify this support. We move before other parts of the UK to increase testing in care homes. Figures from RQA yesterday demonstrated that 3,627 residents have been tested for COVID-19. That represents over a quarter of the total population of care homes in Northern Ireland. At the same time, 3,915 care home staff have also been tested. 
In addition to a significant expansion of testing for care home residents and staff, which will be informed by the advice uh, of the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies and the Department's Strategic Intelligence Group, up to 40 nurses from the HSC are being deployed to support testing in care homes and will be integrated into the support teams currently in place. I have also agreed that testing will be extended into supported living, with this work now underway. And I am ensuring that there is strengthening by trusts of hospital to community outreach teams who deliver specialist care and support to older people in care homes and their own homes. Considerable support has also been provided to the care sector through the provision of free charged staffing time to care providers and making available a range of training materials and courses on topics such as the practical nursing skills, the management of acutely ill patients and infection control available to care home staff. In addition, a service support team has been set up by the RQIA to allow experienced inspectors with backgrounds in nursing and social work to provide direct advice to care homes and domiciliary care providers, with over 1,000 contacts to this team having been made to date. This pandemic has highlighted again the importance of the work which is undertaken day and daily within social care. And as such, I am currently finalising a paper for the Executive which charts a way ahead for this sector, including as an immediate priority additional support for staff. However, in addition to these immediate actions, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need to reflect and plan for the frailty and clinical actuity of residents in homes. There has been a significant shift in the complexity of care provided over recent years, and the staffing profile needed to provide the best care has also changed. With requirements for more registered nurses and a multidisciplinary team, those residents who would have been in hospital five years ago due to multiple morbidities and receiving palliative or end of care for many long-term conditions are often now cared for in nursing and residential homes. Residential homes have now become what used to be nursing homes. As I said in the, the, the press statement yesterday, the social care sector has been struggling for years and as a whole is not fit for purpose. The structural reasons for this are well document, documented and are no fault of the staff. Reforming social care remains one of the most difficult long-term challenges facing modern-day government. I am therefore proposing to move ahead with the reform and investment plans subject to the necessary financial support being provided by the Executive. The pandemic has also drawn attention to the frailty of the care home sector, which has needed so much support to maintain service safely. If we are to get, be better prepared for the future, we will need to address the systemic staffing challenges faced by the sector. As an early priority, I want to see training and terms and conditions for care home staff being standardised and improved. We will have to ensure that the return on this investment will be to the benefit of staff and residents, not the profit margins of operators. That means a decent wage, increasing sick level pay, a career pathway and training to do the job safely and well. I accept that many providers already provide this, and in the future we must ensure that all do. And if I diverge for a moment, it won't surprise this House to learn that I'm not over familiar with Gaelic games, but the phrase hurlers on the ditch has been stuck in my mind of late. It refers to those who are sniping from the sidelines and staying on the sidelines. We've had plenty of hurlers from the ditch of late, experts and self-appointed experts with nothing but criticism to offer. The truth is there are no easy answers, no magic solutions. The situation we are dealing with is unprecedented, very tough and extremely complicated. Often the best we can do is find the least worse option. Keeping the lockdown takes a huge toll, but relaxing it too widely and too early would be catastrophic. Even the wisdom of Solomon would be stretched. Moving on then to PPE, I'm pleased to be able to update the committee that there is a real coordinated effort to support the national PPE supply. And the UK Four Nations Mutual Aid Agreement in place is helping to get PPE to where it is needed. 
Most recently, we have shared approximately 1.8 million items of personal protection equipment with the Department of Health and Social Care, and have received over 6 million individual items of personal protective equipment from them, and that includes the Department of Health and Social Care in England and Wales, as a result of the mutual aid arrangements. Business service organisations continue to distribute significant PPE supplies to all five HSE trusts, and indeed just last week BSO reported that they had distributed over 6.8 million items of PPE across trusts. You may be aware of recent advice emanating from DHSC to withdraw some Tiger Eye Protection medical products due to issues with their fit. This matter was addressed swiftly with all trusts notified to cease supply and recall on any items as underway. Thankfully, this has not had a significant impact on supply locally, as there are current adequate face visors in stock or in order to meet demand at current levels. I would also like to advise members that we are working to build up our PPE supplies from the post-surge period and any possible second wave uh, that will pursue and we will pursue every feasible route locally and indeed internationally to do this. A further development in my approach to combating this disease is the preparation of a test, trace, isolate and support strategy, which will set out the public health approach to minimising COVID-19 transmission in the community in Northern Ireland. My department is currently progressing this work, which is designed to break the chain of transmission of the virus by identifying people with COVID-19, those are known cases, tracing people who have been in close contact with them, known as contacts, and supporting those people to self-isolate so that if they have the disease, they are less likely to transmit it to others. The Chief Medical Officer has established a strategic oversight board for this work, and support from the public will be absolutely critical to its success. I appreciate some people may have concerns about what this might mean for their own privacy, but I would like to assure you that participation will be voluntary and people will have full control over what information they choose to disclose. One of the key elements of this work is the development of a Northern Ireland contact tracing service. Over recent weeks, the Public Health Agency has carried out a pilot to test our approach and a training programme has been developed. We are also working to ensure that there is a clear pathway for all citizens joining up a range of elements of the system, including the COVID-19 system tracker, 111 helpline, GP and HSC services, testing, results and the contact tracing service. Members may be aware that the Education Minister and I have been working to support the childcare sector during the pandemic, and I want to take the opportunity to provide you with an update on this work now. £12 million has been invested in a COVID-19 childcare sector support scheme, which primarily aims to ensure both the continuity of childcare through the pandemic for vulnerable children and key workers, and to support the sustainability of the sector and certain knowledge that we will need childcare to be available when we return to the new normal. The scheme will cover the period from the 1st of April to the 30th of June 2020 and will provide support for four categories of childcare provider. The first being open daycare and school-aged childcare settings. The second, closed daycare and school-aged childcare settings. The third, child, care, child minders continue to provide childcare and the last, daycare workers who have been providing childcare in the homes of key workers under a bespoke approved home childcare system. Any provider who falls with any of the four categories has now been invited to apply for financial support from the scheme, and we expect around 1,500 applications covering all four categories of the scheme to be submitted this month. In conclusion, Chair, um, I am conscious that I have taken some time to provide you with this update and that you will again be keen to ask a number of important questions. But I hope you feel that the update I have provided today has been useful and has hopefully covered a number of points that you have been intended to raise yourself. In finishing my statement, I would like to add that, as ever, the people employed in the care of others are and continue to be our greatest asset. As such, they need to be looked after and cared for in return. It doesn't give me any pleasure to say this. But I do think that over the last decade, 
Stormont has let the NHS down. It has not looked after health and social care services as well as it could. I know under devolution this place has had very limited control over finance, and that has made things very difficult. But still, vital services have been underfunded. Short-term decisions were preferred over long-term planning. Difficult choices were ducked. Staff were left to feel unappreciated. Social care was particularly neglected. This happened in other countries too, so Northern Ireland is not unique. But I think a bit of humility and reflection will be in order around this House. Underfunding and short-term planning led to staff levels becoming depleted. Persistent single-year budgets have seen health care surviving hand-to-mouth, with a limited ability to plan strategically and deliver better services. Similarly, lack of proper pay on career structures and social care left their care homes exposed. Running health and social care on close to empty for 10 years robbed it of capacity, resilience and flexibility. It left us with no option but to scramble to free up capacity and procure much needed equipment at pace. In conclusion, I would like to put on record again my thanks to all those frontline workers who are giving so much and to all those who are working behind the scenes to enable our fight to continue. I would now welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, I will allow around an hour for questions to the Minister. Given um, the position that he holds, members, it is not my intention to keep the Minister in this chamber for any significant amount of time over that hour. So please keep the questions focused and direct. I will allow supplementaries, but it's not necessary for every member to take them if the answer to your first question is sufficiently given. The first person that I want to call is the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. And I want to thank the Minister for his statement today and for coming to the Chamber to answer questions. And I would acknowledge your remarks in terms of that there are no, no perfect answers and that this is a hugely complex situation. However, I know that the Minister will agree with me that where mistakes were made, it's crucial that those are identified and are not repeated as we are likely facing into further waves of this pandemic and potentially future pandemics. So learning the lessons and implementing the learning, I think, is crucial. In relation to that, the Health Committee this morning were addressed by uh, a, an acknowledged panel of experts. And during that, we heard that the decision of the British government on the 12th of March to end contact tracing had created an enormous explosion in the spread of COVID-19. Does the Minister agree with that assessment? Minister? Um, I thank the Chair and can I start by apologising to him uh, and the committee that was unable to attend last Thursday's committee meeting. I know myself and the, the Chief Medical Officer were meant to be there, but we had, because of the executive moved, we were unable to do that. But we're here today to, to address the ad hoc. At, at that point, um, I, I think the Chair is actually conflating both the statements. Um, because what he's saying is, you know, let's look and learn lessons. But what I would prefer to him to say is, let's get through this first cut and then look to see to make sure that any mistakes that were made are not repeated. So they start to, to dissect and start to look at points now that only happened a few weeks ago. I think it actually starts to tie up time and commitment, whereas we should be actually looking at what we're doing now. The fact that we've established our own contact tracing team here in Northern Ireland is already on the ground, it's already working in care homes, 58 people, 324 this week to add to that. So while, while I know where, where the chair is going, and I, I know his question is genuine, I know his intention of making sure that this does not happen again is well placed, but let's not start now to distract, di dissect the steps that we have taken over the last few weeks. Let's get through where we are now and then let's really learn the lessons of what could have been done better and what we have to do to prepare for the next phase. Mr Gildenew, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer, but it does cause me com some concern that we're saying we're waiting to a later stage to look at what I'm, what I'm asking is that lessons that are acknowledged are looked at now and implemented so we don't repeat those mistakes. I know there are steps being taken to ramp up the, the, finding, the case finding, the testing, the contact tracing, 
and, and potential isolation for those people. But given that we were on a different place in the curve than where Britain was at that time, does he acknowledge that it was a mistake for us to cease the contact tracing here? And my question is not about looking back, it's about preparing for further waves of this pandemic. Yeah, and, and I think that's, you know, that's what, what I'm saying to the Chair. Now, we have our contact tracing scheme up and running with 58 contact tracers in place, which was far above what we had when this pandemic hit us at the start, and we were actually relying on PHA to do that contact tracing. So we've brought in a professional system now. We're setting up our own professional team to do that. So and in regards to moving contact tracing to where we were then to where we are now, we've made leaps and bounds. There's a big change being made there, because it's one of the things we've also been able to do when it, this pandemic started, it was about contact tracing and seeing who else they've been coming in contact with. What we're now looking at is actually tracing and supporting as well, because that's, that's the important step that wasn't there at the beginning. So when we contact trace somebody and we identify them as having COVID-19 or being positive, that there's also a support measure can come in behind them that allows them and encourages them to stay in the house and doesn't encourage them to get back into the workplace or into society to spread it further. I call the Deputy Chair of the Committee, Mrs Pam Cameron. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, detailed statement to the House. We will all welcome the de-escalation de in surge level in order to introduce um, emergency surgery. Given the concern over the volume of non-COVID-related deaths in Northern Ireland, it is disappointing that the response has not been more helpful in ensuring accurate reporting. And of course, the move ahead with reform and investment plans is very much welcome. I want to ask the Minister what engagement and support he has had from the unions in relation to any additional proposals in combating or protecting our care homes from outbreaks of coronavirus. Um, we, we, uh, and across, I, I suppose, across this entire piece, uh, we've had good engagement from our entire workforce. And, and support from the trade unions ourselves. But one disappointing um, aspect, and I think it was reported in one of the newspapers this morning, we had brought forward a suggestion of, of a safe at home scheme, which would actually have seen um, employees of care homes actually living in the care home for a period of time, and by doing that would have reduced the interaction. Unfortunately, our, our trade union colleagues had a number of concerns that didn't allow, didn't allow us to move uh, on at that point. Uh, which was earlier this week. So, whereas the particular scheme we were looking at in regards to a number of homes have, ha hasn't been able to progress because of those concerns, we are now in contact with all other care home providers to see if there's any of them want to pick up in regards to that, because there is an allocated pot of money within the department that has been supported to the executive, so that we don't lose the opportunity that that scheme to, could provide. But our, our, our relationship with our trade union colleagues has been good through this because we have been reliant on, on the trade unions here in Northern Ireland and our staff to pull out all the stops and work together with this. Mrs Cameron, for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that um, answer. And I hope that the Safe at Home scheme does go ahead in some uh, format, because it, it, it stands to sense that, that this could be very much a, a way of uh, reducing infection. Um, Minister, you'll be aware that the speech and language therapists are lobbying um, actively the Department for recognition of the vital work they are doing in terms of dealing with COVID-19 patients, including swallowing assessments. Um, will the Minister give commitment here today that those speech and language therapists will be allowed to access full that's code red, PPE whilst providing this high-risk, close contact and life-saving life assessment, um, whether in hospital or in a care home setting? Um, and I know that the member has written to me on this specific issue, and, and it is something that has been actively pursued because it's not just the swallowing, it's the cough reflex, which I think is the, the speech and language therapist is especially worried about because it's just the transfer of, of those droplets. That has been reviewed and updated because it has something has been has been drawn to our attention. But uh, it's also in regards to the speech and language therapists and the work they're doing. Um, when we actually established it, when we went out to visit the, the Newton Arts MOT Centre where we were actually doing the testing there, there was a speech and language therapist actually there on the front line doing the swabs in full gear because they understood the gag reflex, which some of the swabs actually helped. So our speech and language therapists are actually standing up and going above and supporting the front line, uh, the front line battle, which has COVID as well. So it's not just they're not just doing their normal work; they're actually part of our overall response as well. So it's currently an active issue that we're looking at within the department in regards to the PPE. Oh, Mr. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your statement. And 
I would like to refer to the issue of care homes. Minister, I know you're aware, and I'm aware, that there are staff members in care homes that, if they suspect themselves of being symptomatic and do the right thing by staying at home, they will do so without pay. Now, we know that's a very vulnerable weakness, both for the staff member and all the residents in the care home. And I would ask the Minister, will he take urgent action and close this today? This is not a time, to, like you say, to, to reflect back and see how it happened. It's a matter of making it stop now. And I thank the, the member for her point, because I am aware, because we're, we are now reliant on the private sector, for, for the employment of a lot of lo those individuals that they do move them to statutory, statutory sick pay, it's not no pay, it's statutory sick pay, which does leave a lot of those individuals who are actually working on minimum wage. Now, one of the things that I suppose one of the recommendations that was talked about this morning and the executive was doing exactly what the member asked, and Minister Pitts raised it, and made a, a very, was very supportive in the argument I was putting forward. So in regards to, to the executive being on board to address that, I will have a paper very shortly with the Minister of Finance and to give all due to, to his office and the support that we are getting there, the money that has been come forward to address issues as we put for them are progressed very, very quickly. But we also have to be aware of the responsibility that lies with them, with their employer as well. Although the, the, the overall pay rate for some of these people has been, been cut back, they should not have been put in a position where they could actually be coming into a workplace that could increase uh, the spread of COVID-19. Mrs Bradley, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I did have a supplementary on uh, the All-Ireland approach, but I really feel a need to come back to my original question and ask, is this really a time for papers? These are the people who are holding the hands of people today so they don't die alone. These are the people we rely on so heavily. Can we, as an executive, not find the function to do this today? And what will... What I'll say to the member, uh, the, we were at an executive this morning. There's an ex we're going back to it. The, as soon as I would say, as soon as I come out here as well, I'll raise the, I'll raise the issue with the member. But due to due to the transparency and the accountability that we have, there's business cases and papers to put in, and that's what I'm saying. They're being processed very, very quickly. Honestly, I've never seen you know, the executive as agile and is responding very, very aptly to the, the proposals and the need that has been put forward through COVID-19. It's an issue that's been raised, and I can assure the member I'll raise it again this afternoon. Call Mr. Allen, Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, you made reference to the hurlers from the ditch, uh, and it illustrates uh, an important point. Uh, you also referred to the wisdom of Sullivan, and I think a lot of the hurlers from the ditch out there seem to think that they possess double the wisdom that uh, Sullivan ever had. Uh, I welcome the increased testing in our nursing and care homes. However, as the Minister has often said in the past, testing does not provide immunity from the virus. I understand that anyone, no matter what age or circumstances, could test negative one day but positive the next. Recognising the frail condition of many of the older people in our homes, can the Minister advise what support has been made available to our homes to allow them to carry out the tests properly and with sensitivity? And again, I thank the member. And you know, as I said in the statement, I wouldn't be a follower of Gaelic games. But when I heard the phrase, I heard her from the Dutch. I actually asked. It was a member of the SDLP, and they, when they provided the, the explanation to me, um, I've never seen as many in Northern Ireland now that I know what that phrase actually means, and especially on Twitter. Um, in regards to, to the testing support of, of those in care homes, that's why we've utilised uh, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service and those 40 HSC nurses to come in and actually do that. Because I referred to Pam Cameron as that gag reflex. It's not the easiest uh, sample to do or the sample to take. But what I will also, also say to the member, and it was just something that's been finalised since before I came out of the office this morning, in regards to the mobile testing units, which are part of the national testing programme, there's four assigned to, to Northern Ireland, and they will be deploying from the start of next week. Um, the first one I intend to use in the southwest, because we don't have a permanent fixture there, 
at this minute in time, and then we intend uh, to use the other units as they come online in, in a week sort of intervals. Um, they'll be deployed to support programmes uh, for the sampling of our clean non-outbreak care homes and the other cluster outbreaks is required. So it's actually that step up again of using the national testing programme and those mobile test units to reinforce what we've already started with the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. Mr Chambers. Uh, Minister, can residents uh, or their next of kin on their behalf decline to undertake a test? And could that present a problem in the grand scheme of things? I. I would assume they can all. Uh, because of a medical practice, there would be a right uh, for an individual to do that. I, I wouldn't advise anyone to go down that path because it is critical that we do know where this virus is within care homes and, and where, where, we, where it is so, so we can manage it. I'll have to check. I, I would say they have the right to refuse, um, but I would plead with them and advise them not to. Thank you. Bradshaw. Well, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. My question relates to the Comprehensive Recovery Plan. Um, when do you expect that, and how will you make that public? Um, I'll, I'll thank the member. We will be bringing it forward in stages. As the surge plan was schemed so that it moved in four steps, depending on how virulent the virus was across Northern Ireland as to where we had to step down. So we'll be doing the same with the surge plan, and we'll be stepping up as quickly as we possibly can. And that's why we'll be bringing the, the tar block at the Ulster Home for surgery and cancer treatments as soon as we can. I'll bring that forward to the Assembly as we make each stage, as I did with the surge plan, who we were actually reducing that. So we should see the outworkings of that within the next fortnight and those initial steps being taken. Ms Bradshaw for supplementary. Well, just to go further than that in terms of communication with the staff and then ultimately with the patients, some of whom have been waiting for procedures for many years, I think it's important that we let them know when they can expect their treatment. Well, and the member, you know, the member makes that valid point that when we go through when we go through this system, the changes that are the changes that may be possible and will be possible, where we'll need a lot of cooperation from the general public. In regards to anybody receiving notification of a procedure, it's usually a six-week notification. If we get systems up and running quicker, what I'll say to people, if you get notification to come in from a procedure or an elective surgery or a treatment with very little notice, please accept that an invitation as quickly as possible if you can't let the trust know so we can fill those posts. Because before we went into before we went into the COVID-19 and the crisis we were facing, the number of no-shows um, was a problem for a lot of our services across Northern Ireland. So to get us back on our feet, to get Northern Ireland back on its feet, and to get as many people through our service, we need that, that, that support and that continual flow of patients coming forward as well. Call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Can I ask the Minister how many trust staff have been redeployed to care homes? Uh, to a care home setting since the COVID-19 outbreak, and what is the department's longer-term plan uh, to meet the gaps in the staffing whenever uh, normal services resume again? Um, I'll apologise to the member. I don't have exact figure, figures to hand, um, Tom, for that. But what, what I can say, an example of two homes that I know, there, there is a home in Belfast which is avail, availed of the support of 48 uh, Belfast trust staff. There, there's a home within my own, the Northern Trust area, which I feel from the support of 27 Trust staff area. So, so it's a significant number of people. It's a significant number of hours um, being covered as well. I don't have the exact detail, but it's one of those things, and, and it comes um, when I was saying in the statement about making sure the people that we have working in those sectors feel valued and feel supported and are, are supported uh, financially as well as training and uh, everything else that needs to be picking up those posts as well. But we will have a commitment from the trusts and a necessity from the trusts to support our care home sector for the next number of weeks, if not months, to make sure that the staffing level is there to support the residents of those homes, as we undoubtedly see um, you know, people going off sick in the absences um, that, that, that we have seen across the rest of the health service. Call Ms Linda Dillon. Gormayo, good privilege, Cancorlia. Um, if you don't mind, if you can give me indulgence just to apologise to Mr. Carroll for walking in front of him. It certainly wasn't my intention. I actually stood in the doorway until the minister finished speaking, and when I started to walk, Mr. Carroll was called. So I, I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're, I'm sure you're delighted to have Mr. Wales to jump to your defence, Jerry. So, 
Thank you to the Minister for, for your statement. And can you confirm what data is being collected in relation to the HSE staff that are testing positive for COVID? Um, first of all, um, can I express my disgust at the death threat that the member received I think, in this day and age for any politician across Northern Ireland for us still to be in that sphere? I think we've moved far, or we should have moved far, below, far above that. And I know there was another a number of other members within this house, my own party leader, and a number of others were also associated with that. So just just to make that that point, in regards to to the data that, that that's collected, um, when a when a trust member goes off sick with positive, uh, COVID positive, that's reported through the BSO service organisation. So we have this, the statistics of the number of people and at what level they are. Um, within the services, and I said in my statement at this minute in time, we have just over 300 who are off COVID positive, which, in regards to our staff across all trusts of over 71,000, that's a very low percentage at this minute in time. Mr. Lum. Can the Minister give a commitment to include this information on the dashboard and as part of the NISRA figures also? Um, uh, I, I can't give a commitment in regards to NISRA because they're the national statistics body for Northern Ireland. They sit outside my scope. Uh, they fall under the Department of Finance, um, but they, uh, they have their own, their own ability to produce whatever figures um, they see fit. In regards to the dashboard, it's an, evolving, it's an evolving tool which is actually adding additional bits of public information on a regular basis, but it's also something I can raise directly with those who are in charge of it in my IAD department. If that would be a useful, if that would be a useful figure for the member, I'll ask them to, to consider that request. Call Mr. Gordon. Don. Well, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the update and for all your work to date on what has been a very difficult uh, time through, throughout this crisis. In relation to the role of the RQAA, I understand that the um, mandatory inspections or routine inspections were suspended. Do you, as Minister, regret that those inspections were suspended uh, prior to or prior, during this crisis? And do you fully recognise the importance of inspection and surveillance to give assurance to the public and to the residents of those homes? Yeah, in regards to, to what the member has asked, we repurposed our QIA or some of their staff at a very early stage of this pandemic so we could utilise the skills that were there of, of the social workers, of the nurses that were in there to go in and provide advice to care homes. So we moved them from that inspection role to a supporting role. But what I will say to the member, those inspections still can take place. Those inspections still do take place and those inspections still are taking place. Maybe not at the frequency that they used to be, um, but they, it is still, if someone has a concern of a particular home or the practice in it, they can still contact our QIA and raise those concerns as well, because they still have that inspection function. Mr. Dom. Uh, Minister, for your response. You do mention in your uh, speech today about contacts that are made with RQA. Contacts, obviously, that's uh, through over the phone or through an IT system. But can you give us an assurance that the inspections going in, not just doing inspections, but surveillance, the fact that someone goes in that's experienced doing audits, they don't need to carry out full inspections, but the fact that they're there and, and quickly can see the quality that is within a, the home and give everyone an assurance that they're working to the required standards, is that still continuing? Thank you. It, and what I will say to the member, yes, it is. You know, if, if someone has a concern, our QIA will still go in and do, do an inspection if there's a concern of quality there. And that concern can be raised by a family member, a staff member, or a resident, but what I'll also say to the members as well, because we're now at a point where there's trust staff going into those homes, they're actually also acting as an unof well, I suppose unofficial eyes and ears of the department as well to ensure those standards are there because they have a duty of care then, a duty of responsibility as a trust staff member going in to supply uh, that support and guidance that the, the homes themselves are working to the appropriate guidance and standards. And part of the work that's been done in the infection control, especially in regards to homes where we have COVID-19, you know, that work and guidance is critically important as well. And that's, you know, we were able to, you know, 70 dental students actually came forward um, at an early, an early stage to go in and supply infection control uh, guidance and training 
for care homes as well. So that was another set of, of eyes and ears going into those care homes where if there are concerns, they could be raised because of a, they have a responsibility, a professional responsibility if there was unsafe practice to report that. Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, the, the Minister refers to hurlers in the ditch, and quite clearly there is, and uh, in every field of life you will come across them. But the Minister also must accept that uh, when you look at international best practice and when you are taking advice from the likes of WHO and internationally renowned scientists, that, that advice should be taken on board. Those guys could talk out for Kilkenny or Tipperary or, or Antrim on a good day in terms of that. So would the Minister agree with me that uh, we do have to follow international best practice and best practice when tackling this virus. Uh, and I, would, uh, I don't know what tug out means, but I'm sure it's a, as a, as a term that the member can update me with on earlier on, uh, or later on. But in, in regards to that best practice, yes, it is, and the guidance is there. You know, when it comes and when it's practical and applicable for us to follow, we have taken that on. We always haven't been in, in step with it all at all at every every particular point in time, and I know the members, I know the members' party has been particularly vocal in the test, test, test scenario. We were testing at the capability and the capacity that we had at that stage, and it's the point that has been made by the party in regards to the guidance that uh, the World Health Organization have, you know, actually come forward. But what I will also recognise in regards to the executive programme come forward and, and the health advice that un, underpinned that, there is recognition and acknowledgement of WHO guidance and advice and also international best practice as well. PR is another element of, of the Minister's speech. He refers to the inequalities of pay structures and conditions for staff, quite rightly. Will he also agree that as we recover from this epidemic, what we need to tackle is the health inequalities that exist out there, uh, and that has to be a key feature of any future health plan? I would, and it's one of those conversations, and the things that we were doing that uh, were innovative were pilots, as I spoke about as well, that we were only getting. Um, Single budgets for the likes of our multidisciplinary teams. You know they were going to be earth shattering and earth changing and health changing in certain communities where we were putting in social workers, when we were putting in pharmacists into GP surgery, so we could actually start to ta tackle the mental health inequalities and, and, and uh, differentials in supply that we saw across Northern Ireland. So those learnings, those lessons are something that we can take on board as we come into our re-engagement phase between this surge and doing as much work as we can to prevent, prevent the next surge. But the, the inequalities across our system is something that we should take this opportunity now to correct. I note that the member for Upper Ban and our next speaker are both wearing their Arma orange ties today, so congratulations. Sometimes it's all right to be an orange man, John. I call Mr Justin McNulty. The future is orange. Um, um, thank the Minister for his statements and for his answers thus far. The Minister has said that the social care system is not fit for purpose and is in need of uh, reform and investment. And those who work with the most vulnerable in our care system have to be acknowledged, especially um, in care homes that have, been, have borne the brunt of the COVID-19 pan, uh, pandemic. Given the many questions and concerns around the handling of COVID-19 in our care homes, will the Minister commit to calling an independent public inquiry into the handling of the response to COVID-19 when we get through to the other side of this pandemic? And, and I think when I was addressing the, the, the Chair of the Health Committee, you know, when we get through the other side of this, there will be many inquiries. There will be, there'll be national, international, worldwide inquiries. And I think at that point, um, we have to use them as learning tools for where we were, what we should have done, what we could have done, when we could have done it. Because there's no point of getting to the other side of this and not being prepared for the next virus that comes. It may not be a coronavirus, it may not be a novel virus, but when we look um, to the learnings that we have to take out of this, and I've said it before, I said it in previous statements on here, in regards to PPE, we became so reliant on that just-in-time international supply chain for it always to be there that we didn't actually value it for what it was. Now we do. So that's now why it's critically important that we learn in that sphere as well to make sure we have local manufacturing there to support our PPE supply. The Minister referred to hurlers on the ditch. Um, tomorrow evening I'm going to go hurlers for the hospice. Um, I've raised about £2,000 and I'm challenging the Minister and everybody else in this chamber 
to see who are the hurlers in the ditch in this chamber, who will step up to the plate and go hurlers for the hospice, for their own uh, specific hospices in their own area. I know there are a few people very look at this, Scaldi, Lash County Corla and Big Jim, but let's see who will go hurlers for the hospice, raise as much money as we can for hospices whose services have been cut and who need every source of funding they can get. Okay. I, I, I don't exactly understand what the scheme is. It sounds very good. If it's raising money, if it's raising money, it's definitely worthwhile. And but look, I'll give the member a tenner, but I've no idea what he's asking me to do. To be quite honest with you, Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, you certainly have coined the phrase today, "hurler on the ditch," um, and I think. You outlined the, the chief hurler on the ditch has been maybe on Twitter. Media also have a role to play, and sometimes media have been good, sometimes media have not been so good at this time of crisis right across these islands. And thinking of the chief exponent, hurler on the ditch would be Pierce Morgan, in my opinion. However, um, there was a BBC report earlier on today, Minister, uh, I think it's to do with the NHS England, with regard to a fear that the learning disability community would have with regard to testing. And you've outlined some steps that you have taken to testing uh, uh, for our community. I just want you to give us reassurance today that those people who have a learning disability or have a disability will not be disadvantaged in any way when it comes to availing of testing for COVID-19. Give the member that commitment here and now. It's, always, it's, it's already one of the, the cohorts that was in our original testing uh, programme, was those within cohorts or lived in supported learning as well, which included those uh, with, with mental health uh, and learning difficulties. So I have no, no problem giving the member that commitment here today. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, and thank the Minister for uh, his statement. Um, in, in terms of the content of that, he's indicated that our waiting lists are, are deteriorating even further than what they were before we went into to the pandemic. And that will continue to be the case, particularly around things like mental health, um, if we don't start to have some form of relaxation. I know the Minister is under particular pressure because often his executive colleagues will defer to say, I follow the science and the medical advice, and then they look to the Minister for Health. Can the Minister for Health give any indication as to the scientific and medical advice being provided to him as to when we will see step one of the executive plan that was announced earlier this week? Um, I, I will inform you know, the member, as I said, we, we come out of an executive meeting this morning, we'll get back into one this afternoon and into the evening, which is exactly looking at where we are in regards to, to our recovery plan and the step plan that comes out there. And that, that executive has been attended by the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor, as has become nearly the norm over the last number of exec executives. So it's not just the medical and scientific advice that's been given to me, it's been given to the entirety of the executive. Thank you, Minister, for, for that response. And having confidence that decisions are being taken upon medical and scientific evidence, can the Minister give this House an assurance that all of his executive colleagues, when he makes recommendations based upon scientific and medical advice, is then being adopted by the executive, given that it was well documented that he provided advice in respect to the reopening of cemeteries, of which other parties did not endorse and took a week to do so? As we go forward into step one, the public need to have confidence that when this Minister makes recommendations based upon that advice, that the executive is following it. And does the power rest with the minister to act on this solely, or is it a, a collective decision that needs to be taken? I suppose in, in regards to that, I think as we come out of this and we take the steps out of this, we have to do it collectively. But in regards to the advice and the guidance in regards to the regulations, they rest with health, so they do rest with my, my remit legally. So at the end of the day, it's me that has to, has to sign them and seal them. On, on behalf of the Department of Health, so the legal duty of moving through regulations rests with me. I call Ms Catherine Kelly. The Department tells us we have the capacity to complete 2,000 tests per day. Minister, can you explain why we have not been using this to full capacity when it is clear that widespread testing is necessary for pand pandemic control? Um, I thank the member um, for her question. Um, in regards to, I'm not sure, sure she's aware um, of the dashboard that the department now produces on a daily basis, which adds up 
uh, the number of tests that we report internally, but also the number of tests completed um, through the National Testing Programme. Uh, today, that, that dashboard will show that we completed 2,142 tests. Yesterday, we completed 1,994 tests across both those divisions. So when it comes to that capacity, we are getting there because one of the things we've been able to do is utilise the spare capacity that we had within our own system, and that's where we're targeting those tests now uh, for the care homes through the ambulance service as well. So, but that's not where we stop. I'll say that to the member. You know, it's about increasing that capacity. It's working with our colleagues in AFP. It's working with some of the private sector as well to make sure we can roll up that capacity. capacity. As I said to, to Alan, in response to Alan Chambers as well, you know, part of that national capacity is now those four, four mobile testing units which can do up to about 200 tests as, as well. So over the next course of four or five weeks, that'll be an extra 800 tests per day. So it's about utilising that at a continual pace and a continual expansion. But again, like anything else in health, as I said to, to Paula Bradshaw, we need people turning up to take those tests as well. So it's important that if people do want to test, that they actually turn up as well. And again, why one of the mobile units we're putting into the South West, because we don't have that permanent fixture there at this moment in time. Supplementary question? Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, I know you will be aware of the recent news um, on outbreaks within staff at food processing um, factories, and you've mentioned um, the four uh, mobile testing units um, arriving from next week. Um, can you commit to there being a testing unit in OMA? Um, currently, those in food pro processing in OMA um, have to travel a significant distance to Derry, Craigavon, um, or Belfast. You know, and again, you know, in my statement, when I referred to that mobile, and again, it wasn't in the main statement because I only got the, the confirmation before I came out of the office. But out of those four, uh, four testing units, the first mobile unit which should come online within the next week has been assigned to the South West. So that will make the, the, the workers there able to avail of that testing facility there if they are if they are symptomatic or feeling they need a test. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It's essential that the executive recognise the importance of the childcare sector to the well being of our children and access to employment for workers. Can I thank the childcare sector for the role they're playing during the pandemic and for the work they've done with diligent health and education officials to contribute to the child care support scheme. Can I ask the Health Minister to do all he can to support the urgent and successful implementation of the child care support scheme and give a timescale for allocation of funding to child care providers? As I, as I said in, in the statement uh, earlier on, um, any provider who fell under the four categories that I did list, those were the open day care and school aged child care settings, those closed daycare and school aged child care settings, child minders continue to provide child care and the daycare workers who are providing uh, the child care in the homes of key workers under that bespoke approved home child care scheme. That fourth um, grouping is especially important to Northern Ireland. It's something that's very, uh, I think, unique to Northern Ireland as well. So that money that the, the the money has been, we expect, around 1,500 applications covering all four of those categories of the scheme, and those will be submitted this month. So it's about getting those processed through BSO as quickly as we can. And we know it's something as, as chair of the committee that the member has been particularly vocal on. Supplementary. Thank the Health Minister for that update and support for childcare. Can I ask the, min the Minister if he could give some indication to the House um, of what has taken so long to implement a community testing, contact tracing and isolation programme, and to give us some idea of the specific participation that it will require from the public to be successful? Uh, it's one of the things uh, that we need to get right. Um, we have 58 currently. Uh, operators currently trained and out actually starting to do contact tracing. We've started them. They're actually focusing mostly on our care homes at this moment in time. We're training an extra 24 per day, but it's working with, with the script that they're using. So they're asking the right questions. We're identifying the right people and we're giving them the right advice. And then, as I said earlier on to one of the members, that the support package is there as well to encourage them to to actually self-isolate as well. So it's making sure we get that script right. It's also making sure we get the database on the the computer systems to record it that are make sure that those are and they're secure enough in the data that they're capturing. So there's there's a lot of other work going on behind the scenes and also in regards to the app that has been talked about widely but still seems to be quite a number of ways 
no, number of weeks off as to how we get that actually adopted and utilised to make sure, again, that there is security of the data that is captured. So there's a number of technical issues, but I suppose one of the things that I can reassure the member, the, the, the manual one, the 58 workers that we have, the 24 who are being trained um, this week, that manual telephone and personal contact thing is up and running and working and we can utilise that as soon as possible, but it's making sure that we're asking the right questions and asking the right people to isolate. Call Mr Paul Fruit. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, now that the, the Executive has published their five-step plan, and it's all based on science, can the Minister give the House reassurance and inform us about how that science is implemented and about the R rate how he connects the R rate with the decisions along the steps. In regards to um, in regards to the decision process that that has been made, um, the Department of Health uh, developed an executive pa paper on, on the matrix, which showed how how we scored things um, from a threat to to public health, but also the effect it would have on the economy, on social well-being, and the, the fourth, the f the, there's a fourth topic that has escaped me at this moment in time, but each proposal that has been put forward uh, ha has been scored across that matrix as well. So it's not just basically on the R value, we're taking specific requests to look at individual topics uh, individually as well, if e each minister comes forward. Um, I'll give, uh, well it was discussed today, the executive, we're actually going to publish that skills matrix so that the general public can understand how the executive has taken the decisions as we move to step one, step two, step three and eventually step four, where we do return to that, that sphere of normality. So we're publishing that skill matrix later on today or possibly tomorrow that will let members see how that decision-making process has actually been taken. I thank the, the Speaker and the Minister for his answer. And, and as a colleague, a Northampton colleague, I wish him all the best, uh, and I have done uh, up to this point. Can I ask the Minister, I, I take up about the suite of calculations needed uh, in order to make steps. But on the R rate itself, will testing help the accuracy of R rate? And what other measures will help the accuracy of R rate? I suppose when it comes to, to calculating the R rate, and I think Professor Young, our, our Chief Scientific Advisor, did uh, quite a good slot on the Nolan programme yesterday. I didn't listen to it myself, but uh, from what I heard, he did a, a very good job of explaining what it means. The R rate can be measured over a number of things. What we mostly use in, in our scenario is the number of people in ICU beds, the number of admissions, and the number of positive cases. And that's done over the historic past 10 days. So we see a very slow, when we see a slow decrease in the number of those three measures, it starts to move R down very slowly, but it is a slow gradual because we're taking over the past 10 days. So it's it is something that, that we are dependent on, something we look at, but it is not something that is our sole decision making process, for want of a better description. I call Mr. Pat Shane. I got a free last count of the court. I was speaking to the I saw the righteous. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement. I wonder could the Minister give us an update on the infrastructure, the contact tracing infrastructure that has been put in place? How many people are fully trained up? How many are expected to be trained up? How many contact tracing centres there are, and where are those centres, Gormagut? I think the member, in reverse, uh, I suppose, answers to the number of questions there. Pat, the first one we have, the 58 staff currently working on this, is situated in Belfast at this moment in time. BSO, we're training 24 uh, this week because it's a very intense one to one training system. So as we step up uh, that, that training as well, we will be looking at dispersing them around the country, because what we're looking at as well, if we get a, an outbreak of COVID-19 in one of those tracing centres, there's no point of having everybody sitting in the same room so that the people who are trying to trace COVID-19 are all being self-isolated at that point in time. So it's vital that we do spread them out across the province. But in regards to, to the estimation, I think we're moving in the initial phase up to 300 and then potentially up to 600. If we see that necessity, if we don't see, the, I suppose, the management of COVID-19 across Northern Ireland actually decrease. So our first target is to scale up to that 300. Um, we have 800 volunteers um, currently indicated uh, and an indication they would like to be part of that process. But what we have to be cognizant of is this contact tracing scheme will be with us for 18 months, two years, possibly longer. 
So it's not just about relying on those volunteers or the environmental health agency workers who are volunteering to get us up and running initially, but looking at this as a long-term, um, I suppose, civil service deployment because it will be here for quite some time with us. Mr. Sheehan. Uh, good morning. Good. Thanks. Thank you for that, Minister. And, uh, and like most other people, I'm interested in your use of the hurler on the ditch uh, analogy. And as someone who played hurling, and not too many in this house can say that, uh, hurlers on the ditch are an irrelevancy for anyone who plays hurling. And at the minute, Minister, you're playing senior hurling, you're playing senior championship. But what you have to recognise, and uh, my colleague John O'Dowd mentioned it earlier, there are a cohort of experts out there, people like Sean Griffiths, who co-chaired the Hong Kong inquiry into SARS, SARS epidemic in 2003, Michael J. Rand, who, who led the line for the World Health Organization in West Africa in 14 of the 17 Ebola outbreaks, who have all been very critical of the SAGE advice and the decisions that were made by the British government. And this isn't retrospective. They were critical of it at, at the time. And I'm, I'm saying to you, Minister, you need to take advice other than what's being given by SAGE in London. Uh, and, and that's very important. Hurlers on the ditch are irrelevant. But let's look to the real experts, the hurlers on the pitch. And the members, members point and understand that analogy. Thank, thanks, Mr. Uh, but, but I think you know, the, the information we, we've seen now and where we are going you know, in the scientific advisory group, and I mentioned um, when I was talking to Paul earlier on, in regards to our chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer now talking to the executive as a whole, and I think the member will see that we are now moving, we, we always have moved away and we're plotting our own course even more so now in regards to the decisions that the executive is making. In regards to the publication of our or step plan even. We didn't do the same as we didn't do the same as Dublin, we didn't do the same as Westminster by putting dates and time frames on it. We said we were going to be led by the science and taking the right steps at the right time. So I think that proves that as an executive we are taking exactly that guidance and direction from those experts who are on who are on the pitch at this moment in time as well. Uh, these, <coughs> these sporting analogies are making me very tired. The closest to sport I get is bowls on a Monday evening in Ravenhill Presbyterian Church. So that's how exciting I am. I call Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you. I hope you're not getting close to the, that sport at the minute, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, given that we're all supposed to be at home. And I have also played hurling. I've just done it really badly. So I won't, uh, I won't uh, position myself as a, either a hurling expert um, or indeed an epidemiologist. But um, can I ask uh, the Health Minister, after thanking him for his hard work, and uh, which I don't think anyone in this House would doubt, um, uh, and also for coming and giving us an update today, can I ask him about representation from Northern Ireland on SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies? Um, there have been reports that Dr McBride, our Chief Medical Officer, is just an observer, or has been just an observer in that group. Can I ask him if there's anyone, either Dr McBride or anyone else from here, who has full membership of SAGE? Professor Ian Young, our Chief Scientific Advisor, is a full member of SAGE. And thank, thank you for clarifying that, um, uh, Health Minister. That's useful. Um, on contact tracing, he mentioned we want to get to 300 contact tracers, building up to 600. Can he give us a time frame as to when he thinks that's essential? And is that specifically tied, in his mind, to a releasing of the restrictions? They, they, all move in, they all move in a step, uh, Matthew, to be honest, because there, there's no point of easing restrictions if we do have an outbreak and not being able to trace it and find out where it is. So there will be a step. Um, we'll not necessarily have to keep the, the lifting of our restrictions depending on the number of contact tracers we have, but there is a correlation to make sure that we can find and trace the virus if it does turn out to be a spike or in a certain area where we need to move in again and start to put in maybe more localised uh, restrictions. So there's a correlation, but they're not tied to each other. I call Mr Jim Wells. Minister, I'm the only person in the chamber sat in your seat. It was very difficult five years ago. I think it's almost impossible what you have to deal with at the moment. We wish you well. So I know nothing about hurling, and I want to know nothing about hurling, so I'm not going to use any analogy about that. But I want to take you back to the R value. The R value at the minute is given is 0.79. But you've also said that the R value in nursing homes, which unfortunately I'm a bit of an authority on for reasons you will know, 
is double that. Now, frankly, closing garden centres will not reduce the R value in one nursing home, our golf courses, our recycling plants. Are we in a danger of locking down our economy and destroying many good jobs based on an R value which is skewed towards nursing homes when none of the restrictions are going to do anything to reduce that figure? Um, and can I say to the member, um, I, I know how challenging it is at this minute in time in regards to how nursing homes have been closed down to visitors, so I do pass on my personal respects to him and to Grace as well while they get through this very difficult uh, um, and personal time. The R number that he refers to is not the R number that we use at this minute in time is not connected to nursing homes, so they're not part of the calculation. Um, I think when Professor Young, our Chief Scientific Advisor, was talking about that uh, the other morning, he referred to an R value in certain nursing homes. Because what we have to be cognizant of is impossible to give an R figure to nursing homes in the generality, because they are their own isolated, closed spheres, or they should be. So in, in, in the nursing homes where we currently do not have COVID-19, the R value on them is not applicable because there is no virus, there is no spread. So in those homes where we have a high incidence on spread, that's where we're getting up into the, the, the figure above one, which is where the concern, where the, where the virus is actually spreading. So there is no R number for the generality of nursing homes that's applicable. And the R number that we're using that is quoted does not and is not affected by the calculation of, of nursing home infection, Jim. Mr. Wells. Almost a month ago, uh, there was, we all welcomed the announcement by the PHA that 500 staff would be engaged to carry out testing, particularly in nursing homes. Um, we learned today that that was never delivered. In fact, we're talking about less than 10 per cent of that figure. We were told that environmental health officers from various councils who are effectively in furlough would be used. What went wrong? Why was that announcement made and why was it not delivered? Jim, I would, I would need to check the announcement uh, you're referring to because the use of environmental health officers was actually to be brought forward to engage um, in the contact tracing app rather than testing uh, in nursing homes. Uh, if he has a, another announcement that he thinks I've made, I'm, I'm perfectly glad to follow up on it after this. But the environmental health officers were in regard to, to contact tracing. Now, some of those are being used, and I'm aware there's a, a service level agreement. There's, there's some ongoing conversations at this minute in time, but I'm happy to take that issue up with the member upside, outside the House because I'm not sure him and I are maybe talking about the same thing at this minute in time, but I want to get him the right answer. I call Mr Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to thank the Minister for bringing his statement to the Chamber today and for outlining the many uh, important initiatives that he has undertaken. I also want to take this opportunity, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to personally thank all our health and social care staff who have given everything and sacrificed so much to save so many lives and will be forever indebted to them. Minister, in recent weeks, families in my constituency and throughout the Western Trust have lost loved ones to various illnesses, cancer, heart disease, and others. Uh, non related to COVID 19, no symptoms of such. But when it came to the death certificate, it had outlined COVID-19 as the cause of death. The Minister will know that will come as good distress to many families, uh, because they would have argued that that was entirely incorrect, because there was no test to suggest such, nor, or in the event there was a test, it tested negative. Uh, is the Minister aware of this uh, and that it is happening? Can I explain why it is happening, and if such instruction to these medical professionals that are doing such uh, is coming from his department? I can assure the member there is no instruction coming from my department to register COVID-19 deaths um, that they aren't being diagnosed as such. But what I would say to the member as well, as well, if it's uh, a death that is registered in the community where there has been so are, are suspected COVID-19 symptoms, there may be an occasion where a medical professional will record it on the on the death certificate, even if there hasn't been a, a positive case. I'm, I'm, I have had the issue raised with me at the start of this week. It's something I'm looking into, but in regard to a direction being given, there would be no rationale or no reason why we would be asking any medical profession to record COVID-19 on a death certificate where it wasn't either proven or suspected. Mr. McCrossan. 
I thank the Minister for his, question and or for his answer and his clarification of my question. As you will as you'll understand, Minister, it is a very sensitive issue, and it would come as a great surprise to families that find themselves in such circumstances. Without going into detail in relation to the case, I am aware that there were no symptoms in this particular matter uh, and that the person was not on a COVID ward or anything like it. It was very sudden uh, and there was a clear uh, reason for it. Uh, what assurance can you give, Minister, that in the event that such uh, a thing would happen where someone has COVID-19 put on their death certificate or the reason for death being such, uh, how, how can the family go about changing that or challenging that when it is actually incorrect? In, in, in honesty to the member, I'm not sure of how, how that process would be undertaken or undertook, but I'll, I'll check it out and get back to the member in writing and provide it in guidance to the rest of the members in this house as well. Because if there are scenarios where that has happened, there should be a clear line of there should be a clear line of of query or challenge. Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, if I can ask the Minister about um, the reconfigurations of services, are you aware that there are theatre staff from the Down Hospital that have been relocated to the Ulster Hospital to prepare for the surge, but the surge has thankfully not arrived and they've been left with very little work to do? Some of them are taking uh, annual leave because there isn't work to be uh, completed, and yet the work that they would have delivered in the Down is from the 1st of June going to be delivered by a private outside company. This is very, very worrying to staff who are concerned about their futures in amongst all of the distress that there is with this um, pandemic. Is the Minister aware that private companies are coming in to deliver services that our own staff should be doing? What I will say to the member in regards to our, our surge planning, those individuals were purposely relocated and reprofiled so that we would be prepared for the surge. But as he says, thankfully, it has not happened. And remember, let's remember, we are only a number of weeks away from our first case and where we were looking for that reasonable worst-case scenario. So in, re in regards to reprofiling those staff, um, that was the steps that we took at that point in time because it was the right thing to do. We brought in private providers to make sure that there was some delivery of service that continued while we redeployed our own staff. But as asking me for an assurance, will they have enough work to do? I can assure you in regards to our waiting lists and everything else that we have seen long before COVID-19 struck Northern Ireland, our waiting lists are long enough to provide them with a guarantee of work in the future. Can I welcome that statement? I'm sure that will go a long way to actually um, helping people, certainly within the Down Hospital, and I'm sure and, and hope that they won't be forgotten with plenty of work for the future. I call Ms. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to the House today. The Minister has mentioned some issues with the rollout of the potential contact tracing app. Um, some of this has included the protection of data, which is obviously an incredibly sensitive matter. As such, will the Minister be seeking any legal advice on the matter before any further steps are taken for its use in Northern Ireland? Um, yes, because we have data protection issues, and also in regards to how how we interact, especially with our, our colleagues and counterparts in the Republic of Ireland in regards to data sharing, which will be data sharing across uh, an EU border in regards to that as well. So yes, we will be taking legal advice and Section 75 guidance as well in regards to the implementation and the rollout of it because of how it will or potentially capture personal data. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your reply. This is completely different. Um, the roadmap on Tuesday uh, that was published by the Executive had a number of holes in it, but what it didn't show was any information for those who are shielding um, following the letters issued, which is due to end in six weeks. So, does the Minister expect this period to be extended? And if so, will the Department issue further guidance on this? Yes, we will, because what, what is vitally important for those individuals that we asked to, to shield themselves from, from the, the start, it was, it was a request, it was not an insistence, so I make that clear to the member as well. Um, those, those letters went out to ask people to shield themselves away. What we were not asking them was to cut themselves off from the community or in, in totality. We asked them to shield themselves from the virus. If the assessment in another six weeks' time, well, we will have to do it before another six weeks' time to make sure they are supported to do that. But if we are still looking at that period and if the medical and scientific guidance says that we should still ask them to maintain that for another period, we will be issuing more support, more guidance but also making sure that the support is there for them as well. So that should that be the food deliveries or should it be deliveries from community pharmacy as well to make sure they're getting prescriptions, that all those provisions, all those support measures are still in place. I call Mr Jim Allister. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, maybe you permit me one moment initially to say to the Minister, could he convey on behalf of the community and the Smith family uh, to the expert staff in the Royal Victoria uh, Hospital the very deep appreciation for the Trojan efforts to save the life of young Hannah Smith following the heartbreaking uh, incident in our constituency on Tuesday. Uh, and of course, I'm sure we all join in condolences to that family in that indescribable pain and loss that has been suffered. Turning to my question, the Chief Medical Officer has publicly stated that the R figure is low enough and has been low enough for a sufficient amount of time to justify relaxations in the lockdown. Maybe you tell us what it is today, the R number. He says that the National Health Service has not been overwhelmed, the surge did not happen, the Nightingale facility has been stood down. Our economy is in free fall. So what are we waiting on? Is it the feet draggers in the executive? Can, can I say in regards to, to the members' opening comments in regards to the Smith family and their particularly harrowing time at this moment in time, and which is a tragic loss um, to any family to loss, to lose a mother and a child at the same time in a horrific accident, while another one relies on, on the support of our National Health Service is a completely uh, challenging time for any family and for the wider community as well in North Antrim and our thoughts on prayers on the support of the National Health Service are, are doing what they do well in supporting that family and getting as much medical aid and assistance as is possible to, to that family. In regards to, to where we move next, the member will be aware that the, the plan was published um, only recently, and it set out the series of steps that can be taken and the, the, the measures that um, will be used um, at each point. Uh, the first being the control of transmission, and as he rightly indicates, in regards to where R is and maintaining it uh, below 1, the protection of our health care capacity. He is right, our, our systems weren't uh, overwhelmed, and we have stepped down. Uh, the Nightingale facility. But that wasn't a decision that was taken lightly because we were still seeing the number of people in ICUs and the number of hospital admissions uh, at a point uh, that there was still concern. And that's when it comes to easing those measures. Um, we do it at the appropriate time. Uh, and my, my feeling is we will be, we will be doing it. We will, there will be announcements coming from, from the executive shortly, but we do it out of um, necessity and, and take those decisions that we make sure that we retain the restrictions only for as long as are necessary. And I think that's been clear from, from all the parties within the executive at this minute in time. And But I think his point is that we rely on the evidence. So it's the scientific advice coming from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor that guides those decisions as well. Mr. Alistair. The Minister didn't tell us what the R number is currently, but could I, could I hurl this question from this commodious ditch um, and ask him, on Tuesday in the Assembly, the Deputy First Minister pontificated that if and when we got the R number down to 0 0.5, then we could move forward. Now, is she following different science, or is that the advice to the, assembly, to the executive? Is that the collective executive view, that it has to be down to 0 0.5 before the substantial movement? Or, you know, Ms O'Neill is not entitled to her own science, surely, within this executive. Apologies. Jim, it wasn't deliberate. Uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor informed us this morning that the R number is around 0.7. And, and I will say clearly to the member that I have seen no, no documentation or no target of an R number of 0.5 before we move to step one. 
Mr. Jerry Carroll. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, the Minister, for his statement. Uh, the Minister mentioned about the strain on services for our people, and I want to bring uh, to his attention uh, John Price, uh, somebody who I met many years ago on a, on a protest and been on many protests with him, a teacher for many years in my constituency uh, who has had his oral cancer surgery withdrawn as part of the coronavirus measures. And I'd like to ask, uh, could his department do uh, all they can to assist him uh, in his uh, and medical uh, procedures at this time. Uh, the, the Minister said that um, Stormont failed the NHS for many years, uh, something that I would absolutely uh, concur with. And I, I would ask him, given the amount of issues emerging in relation to care homes, in particular around infections, deaths, uh, and the fact that more and more public finance seems to be going into our for profit private care homes, he mentioned about his uh, paper going to the executive around care homes. Is now the time to begin planning and implementing a strategy for bringing care homes into public uh, ownership? Um, in, in regard to the first point, um, if the member wants to give me details of that, I, I can't promise anything, but we will have a look at it. Uh, in regards to, to where we go on care homes, the roadmap is already there. It was published in this place. It's called Power to People, and it laid out a number of very specific steps that the proposals to reboot adult care and support in Northern Ireland. We published it a number of years ago, but it is laying um, and effective and not been taken action on over the past number of years. So it's now that we take this, this document and grasp it and actually start to deliver um, what it proposed and what it envisaged would be a care uh, would be a, re, a reboot um, of adult care support in Northern Ireland. We have seen what we've been able to do in regards to preparation for the surge of COVID-19. We can see how agile the health service can be. We can see how supportive the entire executive can be. So the challenge is now that we do that at haste and speed to make sure we get our care homes and our, 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 our social services into that position as well. I uh, thank the Minister for his uh, answers and I appreciate his comments regarding my first question. I will forward on the details to his uh, office. Uh, my, my recollection uh, on our briefing, uh, I think it was in January, and the Health Committee on the Part of uh, People report uh, was that the sh um, uh, Sean Holland uh, seemed to suggest or certainly not rule out the need or the, uh, the measures uh, to have greater public uh, involvement in the rollout of, of uh, care. I don't want to misquote him, but that was my recollection of, of what he said. So I would like to urge the Minister, when he does present his uh, paper to the Executive, that that is a fundamental part uh, of it. People are coming out and clapping correctly for our NHS, and I think uh, that provision, uh, we were told from the cradle to the grave, that provision to the grave needs to uh, exist in a public role. Uh, is essential in delivering that. Thank you. No, uh, and the member makes, makes <coughs> the point that see, <coughs> excuse me, that sees the the greatest point of our national health service, free from cradle to grave, free at the point of use, free at the point of delivery, and that's something that that we have to make sure as well. So when we've looked at the, the interactions that we have a department, that we have as an executive that we have a state has had to put into some of the private care providers, should it be in staffing, should it be in PPE and general support, there has to be a greater role that we play in the care home provision going forward. Thank you, Minister. Agenda item four is the time, date and place of our next meeting. We have yet to receive confirmation from the executive about, minister, about when ministers will next come to make a statement to this committee. As soon as this confirmation has been received, written notification of the time, date and place of our next meeting will be issued to members in the usual way. However, I would also remind members that a plenary sitting of the Assembly is scheduled to take place on Tuesday the 19th of May and that ministers may continue to make oral statements to the Assembly on sitting days. That concludes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The meeting is adjourned. Stay safe and God bless. Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed.